What you are seeing is a mosaic dated to circa 520 AD from San Vitale Chapel, located in Ravenna, Italy. The mosaic depicts Melchizedek at an altar, preparing a symbolic sacrament, while Abraham and Isaac, seen to the far right, and Abel, seen to the far left, present their sacrifices to the Lord. In the background you can see a veil, parted down the middle, marked at its four corners with gamadia or square-shaped markings. Similar markings can be found on the altar. The Lord's hand is seen protruding from behind the veil. This imagery and the ritual it precludes can be found in modern LDS temple worship, as restored by the prophet Joseph Smith. Many critics of the LDS church claim that Smith, a master mason, plagiarized Freemasonic ceremony to create much of the LDS temple worship and ritual. The trouble with this claim is that many aspects of the temple ceremony, like that which is represented by the mosaic, cannot be found within the realm of Freemasonic drama. It is true that veils are used in the Royal Arch Masonic degree, as seen in the above print, but they are not marked and are used for a different purpose entirely. Twined for centuries, Mormons and Masons both trace their lineage back to King Solomon's Temple. Yeah, Sean, a religion, fraternity, it's got mystery, intrigue, speculation, rumor. What's real? What is a myth? Could it be they're one and the same? Well, tonight we take an inside look inside the doors of the Masonic Temple here in Utah and we examine the strange historical ties that bind Mormons and Masons. Secret rituals mysterious symbols, endowments, temples, two different groups, one religious, one fraternal, intertwined through history. How closely related are Mormons and Masons? The answers might surprise you. A Mason is a man who believes in deity, however he expresses that. He can be a Mormon, a Muslim, a Methodist, that's up to him. Membership lists are secret. So too are Masonic modes of recognition and passwords. But a secret society? Our building stands on about a quarter block. Uh, it says Masonic Temple outside of it. Not terribly secret. Many of us wear pins, we wear rings, we have car decals, we have websites. None of that seems secret. Glenn Cook happens to be the first member of the LDS faith to be elected Grand Master of the Salt Lake Lodge in over 100 years here in Utah. The ritual that we're performing. But most of what goes on inside this temple is for Masons only. And many Masons and Mormons came together in those temples back in the 1800s. Masonry really uh, took root in Nauvoo and... Uh, by the end of 1843, there were between 1,500 and 2,000 Latter-day Saints that uh, belonged to the Masonic fraternity. The Masons were not always inclusive when it came to the Mormon religion. The rift intensified when Joseph Smith, a Nauvoo Mason, started taking liberties with certain Masonic ceremonies. LDS historian Ken Godfrey. Joseph Smith was accused of violating his Masonic oath and pledges by... Uh, initiating women into the Masonic order. It is a test. If a man cannot keep secret something as simple as a handshake, as a password, how can I trust him with the more important obligations? Was Joseph Smith's death a punishment for betraying his Masonic oath? Brigham Young was absolutely convinced that Joseph Smith was giving the Masonic distress signal at the time of his death and that no Masons in, in the group uh, were willing to respond and, and come to his aid. Were the Mormons and Masons involved in a power struggle over ideology or ritual? Both trace their rites and ceremonies back to King Solomon's temple. Now if you compare the temple endowment with Masonry, there's about 40 words and phrases that are the same in both ceremonies. And they're so much the same that you would probably have to uh, 
uh, take the stand that those were borrowed by Joseph Smith. Most Masons agree that any Masonic involvement in Smith's death was coincidence, a coincidence that further divided the two groups. So the flavor you get is that Masons killed Joseph Smith, a brother Mason, who were then judged by Masons and acquitted of their crime. Now that leaves a bad taste in your mouth. For 60 years, Mormons and Masons did not mix. The Masons lifted the ban on Mormon membership in 1984. We as a fraternity have put behind us the animosity that existed at that time. Still, the intrigue surrounding Freemasonry remains today. Dan Brown's book, The Lost Symbol, about a missing Masonic treasure is a bestseller. Jack the Ripper was said to be Sir William Gull, a Freemason with ties to the royal family. The all-seeing eye on the dollar bill as a Masonic symbol. And many founding fathers, like George Washington, were active Freemasons. Some even say the Freemasons have infiltrated all segments of society and government and ultimately control the course of history. Is it true? Does something ever come into play where it's time for us to act? It's time for Masons in certain positions to take the, take the reins and move this country in a different direction? No, there, there is no organization of Masons where we say it's time to step in and correct the political system or the current political view. That's not something that we do. But Masons do seem to enjoy the mystery of it all, especially those parts that can't really be proven one way or the other. Some are speculation founded on speculation, uh, confirmed by nothing. Others are very factual. They take elements of history and then spin a good yarn out of it, and that's great. As long as we remember that those are fiction based on fact. But Masons still covet their secrets, a practice familiar to Latter-day Saints. Fascinating stories. Mm -hmm. A lot of it you can't prove. You know, recorded history only goes back to about 1500, and you know that's why there's so much conjecture and speculation and rumor because a lot of it you can't you can't base in any historical fact. But you know, if you want to find out more about Freemasonry in Utah, they have a, a big open house schedule for this weekend at the uh, Grand uh, Temple here in Salt Lake City. It's uh, Saturday between 10 a.m. and 2 in the afternoon. So, who can become a Mason? How tough is it to get involved in this? Uh, women can't. Women are not allowed in the fraternity. And it's not a sure thing, Shawnee. You have to be sponsored by two other Masons, so there's sponsorship there. You have to prove your character. You have to be of good moral character. You, you must meet and open your home to other Masons who come in and interview you and talk to you and make sure you're a good candidate. You have to believe in a supreme being, and you have to be able to pay dues and support your respective lodge, among other things. And then, of course, there's initiative rights and things like that once you get in to the lodge. So. Uh, because they're secretive, is it unusual that he was willing to be so candid and to speak out like that? You know, he, he says that, that there's more conjecture and rumor about secrecy when it comes to the Masons. Huh. He, says, he says that people are allowed to go into the temple and actually attend uh, some of their meetings. It's only, it's only when they're taking their specific rights that uh, it's closed off and it's secretive. So he says it's not as secretive as people make it out to be. He says people like to think it's secretive. Uh, it makes for a better story. So Fascinating. Yeah, it is.
I am a Christian. I honestly believe that talking about someone else's religion is wrong. It makes you seem ignorant and made me realize how unchristian like you act. I really would like to ask you to stop talking bad about others' belief. Christ was our greatest example of showing love to those who didn't believe in him and his greatest commandment. Yeah, that's why he told those people, you're a child of the devil and, and, uh, and uh, Satan is your father and you're going to go to hell if you don't believe that I am God. Uh, you know, people, you talk like that today, people would say, you know, no, uh, uh, that's not loving, but that's what Christ did. That word love, so many interpret to mean so many things. So many people interpret it as mean never causing pain, never inflicting difficulty on a person. Jesus did that all day long, all day long. Let me tell you about your sin, woman at the well. Let me tell you about this and that. Truth in love is what it's all about. Uh, so, and then we have Sean, Buddhist mother. Mormonism is, above all other things, an immersive discipleship of Jesus Christ. That's not so much a religion about Jesus as it is an aspiration to live the religion of Jesus. This gospel is to trust in, change toward, and fully immerse both our bodies and our minds in the role of Christ become gods and saviors, to console and to heal and to raise each other up together. This is the heart of Mormonism. This gospel of Jesus Christ underlies Mormon transhumanism. Mormons situate ourselves today in what we call the dispensation of the fullness of times as a time of great advancement in knowledge and power when we should expect the sciences that flourish. Immortality is physical, it's embodied. There is in Mormonism this notion of progressively improving bodies as well. And our scriptures have this idea of a transfigured being receives a certain quality of body, but then a resurrected being receives an even better body, a more robust body. I am a transhumanist, not despite my Mormonism, but rather I'm a transhumanist because of my Mormonism. My Mormonism mandates transhumanism. Our scriptures require implicit transhumanism. And many Mormons are transhumanists not because we were trying to find a solution to fix our religion. Our religion led us to transhumanism. We feel a spiritual mandate to engage in transhumanism. What is happening here may be unique in American history. The marches you see are not protesting unfair labor practices or advocating a political cause. They are here to challenge the conscience of the wealthy and powerful Watchtower Society, better known to the public as Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses have a massive international organization with millions of members and hundreds of millions of dollars. A gift that God gave to the human race. But this deeply committed group is not likely to be intimidated. They have an urgent message to deliver. You can't see the hurt that we feel, but we have, we have so much pain because so many of us are separated from our families because 
of the of the Watchtower organization's rules, unfair, unkind, unloving, unchristian rules. The organization sets itself up in the place of Christ, and that is something that the Bible does not teach. The reason we are here today is to attract attention to a genuine false prophet, a genuine false prophet that Jesus warned us about. They have lied to us, they have deceived us, and we have the documented evidence. nightmare far removed from mankind's greatest dream paradise surely all of us are thrilled at the prospect of surviving the end of this wicked world and living on into God's righteous new order what a grand future awaits us this confident statement brimming with hope is from the Watchtower Society's publication you can live forever in paradise on earth it is this promise that attracts the new convert to become a Jehovah's Witness. The thing that attracted me to the Watchtower Society was that they taught that Armageddon was so close that those uh, who were living now would never have to die, but that they could live forever. I think one of the greatest uh, things that appeals to the people is that uh, we are taught, that we were taught, that uh, we could live forever here on the earth, and there would be peace, perfect peace among men and animals. The little children could play with the animals and uh, there would be no harm or no hurt in all of the earth. Jehovah's Witnesses came along with a positive message, I thought, from the Bible. God had a plan and purpose for Martin Merriman and that is what I wanted, to please God. Martin Merriman was not alone on the Jehovah's Witness road. Statistics show that in the 22-year period between 1963 and 1985, the Jehovah's Witness organization grew from one million members to three million. Jehovah's Witness spokesman Eugene Mortensen. The increase the Jehovah's Witnesses are experiencing right now is phenomenal. Last year, for an example, worldwide, we had a 6.8% increase. It all began in Pennsylvania in the late 1800s when Charles Taze Russell came under the influence of a second Adventist preacher. Russell initiated his own Bible study class, a small group that would ultimately grow to become the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Borrowing directly from the prophetic speculations of Nelson Barber, a New York second Adventist, Russell claimed that in 1799, the world had entered the time of the end. That in 1874, Jesus Christ had returned invisibly. And that the world would come to an end in the year 1914. In 1879, Russell, then 27 years of age, was so passionately convinced these prophetic dates were given by God, that he sold his prosperous clothing business and struck out in a new direction. With very little education or theological background, he began printing the magazine Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence. Known today as the Watchtower, this publication, which has grown from an initial printing of 6,000 to well over 288 million copies annually, dictates all major doctrines to Jehovah's Witnesses. During his lifetime, Russell authored a vast amount of literature, including a series of volumes entitled Studies in the Scriptures. According to Russell, no one could understand the Bible without these books, and reading the Bible alone would lead only to spiritual darkness. One of Russell's teachings was that Egypt's Great Pyramid was designed and placed there by God as his second witness next to the Bible. It would be an instrument to reveal his great plan of the ages for mankind. This measurement indicates the length of the year, 
the weight of the earth, the distance to the sun, etc. Russell believed his dates and chronology were confirmed by the measurements of the interior passageways of the Great Pyramid. According to Russell, the passageways verified 1914 as the year the world would end. Finally, 1914 came and went. Russell and his followers were not raptured from the earth and the end had not come. John Knight, who was 15 years old at the time, remembers what came next. Well, when 1914 came, of course, uh, we had to change our views, just like we had to change the views later. The date was pushed forward to 1915. Then, 1918. Certainly Armageddon was just around the corner. But in 1916, Charles Taze Russell died, sick, weary, and disappointed. A massive stone pyramid stands today at his gravesite as an embarrassing reminder of his false prophecies. Through hard-fisted inside political manipulation, Joseph Franklin Rutherford, a Missouri lawyer who had given himself the title of judge, became the second president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society in 1917. In 1918, Judge Rutherford's lecture, entitled Millions Now Living Will Never Die, was the beginning of a worldwide recruiting effort called the Millions Campaign. Not too surprisingly, it proclaimed the coming destruction of the existing world. It would happen soon, in 1925. Based upon the promises set forth in the divine word, we must reach the positive and indisputable conclusion that millions now living will never die. In 1920, the Millions Book was published. In it, Rutherford claimed the Bible proved that in 1925, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and other faithful men of old were to be resurrected, to rule henceforth as princes on the new Paradise Earth. Fully convinced that Rutherford's prophecy was true, many witnesses sold their homes and businesses and took to the road. Living in cars and trucks like itinerant peddlers, they spread the warning. As 1925 drew closer, some farmers even refused to plant crops because they believed the end was at hand. Finally, 1925 came. And, as in 1914, nothing happened. Once again, the Watchtower Society's prophecy had proven false. As Russell had done, Rutherford doggedly held to the story that the end was just around the corner. In 1929, the judge had this palatial mansion constructed. It was deeded to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so they and other ancient worthies would have a place to live when they were resurrected. Located in an exclusive district of San Diego, it was given the name Beth Sarim, Hebrew for House of the Princes. The world entered the Great Depression, but Rutherford lived like a millionaire spending the winter months at Beth Serene, summering in Europe. As Americans suffered through poverty and deprivation, Rutherford enjoyed the use of two 16-cylinder Cadillacs. Under Rutherford, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society became a well-oiled corporation. New books, literature, and tracts poured forth in a flood to be sold door-to-door -door by faithful witnesses. He drove his followers to labor hard for the Lord. He advised young couples not to marry, but to put all their energies into proclaiming the kingdom. Even portable phonographs were utilized at the doorstep. Because the people have been induced to believe that Christianity and religion are the same thing. 
Around the world, zealous witnesses paraded in front of churches on Sunday mornings, bearing placards with the slogan, Religion is a snare and a racket. <coughs> Keeping up with the times, the society constructed its own radio station. And by 1933, there were 403 stations nationwide broadcasting Rutherford's abusive railings against the clergy, politicians, and what he referred to as the greedy commercialists. On the radio and in print, he continually stressed that the end of the world was just months away. The end finally came, but only for Rutherford. In 1942, he died at Beth Serene, the house he had built as a luxurious testimony to God's name. In retrospect, perhaps the only testimony this lovely mansion ever gave was to the cash value of false prophecy. In 1948, the society quietly sold the property, covering up an embarrassing chapter in its history. Today, most modern Jehovah's Witnesses are unaware that Beth Sarim ever existed. There is not one religious With Rutherford's passing, the flamboyant era of charismatic personalities passed as well. Today, fueled by the anxieties of a nuclear age, the Watchtower Society is a multinational corporate giant, spreading its new message of doom to every corner of the globe. Standing between God and the millions of Jehovah's Witnesses is an autocratic ruling council called the Governing Body. Because Jehovah's Witnesses believe the Word of God is channeled to humanity through this elite committee alone, these men rule with unchallenged authority. Every witness is subject to their dictatorship, from the cradle to the grave. Raymond Franz, author of the book Crisis of Conscience, was a member of the Watchtower Society's governing body for nine of his 60 years as a Jehovah's Witness. His account of their secret sessions is revealing. I must say that it was one of the most disillusioning experiences of my life. Uh, it came as a a rude awakening to me to see what actually went on. I envisioned the governing body as a body of men to whom the, the Bible, God's Word, was the controlling force in every one of their decisions who really dug into the scriptures to make sure that everything that they did was soundly based upon the Bible. And when I got into the governing body, I found that the Bible was rarely appealed to, was rarely used, that mainly was a matter of discussing organizational policy and how to apply this organizational policy. And I found that again and again when issues came up, even though scriptures might pre be presented, if there was an organizational policy, that policy would take precedence over scripture. And I couldn't help but think of Jesus' words in Matthew 23 that they have made the word of God null and void because of their tradition. While the organization may not always consult scripture in determining policy, they never hesitate to cite scripture as proof of their authority. The Watchtower Society claims that it is the faithful and wise servant, or as Jehovah's Witnesses have translated it, the faithful and discreet slave spoken of in Matthew 24. Leonard and Marjorie Cretian are authors of the book, Witnesses of Jehovah. For 22 years, they were loyal Jehovah's Witnesses. Leonard had risen to the position of elder and presiding overseer. The original belief was that Charles Taze Russell was the chosen slave. The Watchtower Society taught that the stewardship of the things of God had been taken away from the Christian churches and given to Russell. When Russell died, they had to adjust their belief to fit a new set of facts. Now they claim that in 1919, having invisibly come into power over the earth, Christ needed an organization to announce his kingdom and administer his affairs here. So the story goes, he carefully examined all the Christian religions and rejected them in favor of the Watchtower Society. Peter Gregerson was a member of the Watchtower Society for nearly 50 years. He was a highly respected elder and served in a number of responsible positions. And as a result, I started to do some very serious thinking about things that were going on inside the organization. 
It seemed to me, though, that everything always came back to the question, is the Watchtower Society and its leadership, are they the faithful slave? I really wanted to prove to myself that the Watchtower Society was right. Gregerson decided to examine the same teachings that Christ would have examined in 1919 when he was supposedly evaluating the world's religious organizations. The Watchtower's latest teachings at that time were published in a book called The Finished Mystery. What I found absolutely destroyed my confidence in the Watchtower. They had said that the end of the world would come in 1914. And in this book that was just hot off the presses for Christ to investigate, we're saying that by the spring of 1918, millions of people would be dying in the streets throughout the world. It, it wasn't happening in 1918. Christ was supposedly examining this written material to see whether the Watchtower Society should be put in charge of all of God's interests on the earth, and they were guilty of the worst kind of false prophecy. In addition to false prophecy, the finished mystery contained a number of other pretty ludicrous interpretations of Scripture. According to them, Revelation 12 clearly shows that Michael and his angels are the Pope of Rome and his bishops. Revelation 14 mentions a distance of 1,600 furlongs, which this fascinating book explains is the distance from Scranton, Pennsylvania, to Watchtower headquarters in Brooklyn, provided you go by way of the Hoboken Ferry and the Lackawanna Railroad. The Bible speaks of the great sea monster, Leviathan. You may want to know what the Leviathan really looked like. The finished mystery told Jehovah's Witnesses that the Leviathan was a steam locomotive, and this little coupling link was its tongue. This book, the Watchtower's main teaching book of the time, included a prediction that in 1918, demons would invade the minds of the Christian church, which they refer to as the swine class. We wish every Jehovah's Witness today could read the finished mystery for themselves. They would probably reach the same conclusion Peter Gregerson did. I spent a lot of time praying, a lot of time thinking, came to the conclusion there was no possible way that Christ Jesus as a judge could have looked at this information and have given the authority that was claimed by the Watchtower Society. Still, Jehovah's Witnesses maintain that theirs is the only true religion. All others constitute the worldwide empire of false religion, the Whore of Babylon spoken of in the book of Revelation. The Watchtower says these religions are guilty of spiritual fornication with the political and commercial rulers of the world and will all be slaughtered by God at Armageddon. Only the true Christians, Jehovah's Witnesses, will survive. F.M. Geip, a Watchtower spokesman and member of the headquarters staff, explains. Well, we feel Jehovah's Witnesses are the only true religion, otherwise we would be teaching something else. But the reason is because we follow the Bible completely. To support its beliefs, the Watchtower organization has published its own version of the Bible, called the New World Translation. To lend credence to this translation, the Watchtower Society has deliberately misquoted a number of well-known Greek scholars. Dr. J. R. Manti, an eminent Greek scholar, was one of the authorities quoted out of context. The Watchtower Society has implied that he supports their New World Translation. Dr. Manti disagrees. I have never found any so-called translation that goes so far away from what the Scripture actually teaches as these books published by Jehovah's Witnesses. They are so far away from what there is in the original Hebrew and the original Greek. Dr. Manti called the Jehovah's Witness Bible a shocking mistranslation, obsolete and incorrect. You can't follow. There's because it's biased and uh, it's deceptive because they deliberately changed words in a passage of scripture to make it fit into their doctrine. They distorted the scripture in many passages, scores and scores of passages in the New Testament, dealing with the deity of Christ especially. To find additional support for their altered scriptures, the Watchtower has even turned to the occult. The New Testament, a Bible translation by Johannes Grieber, has been used as an authority in many of their publications. Johannes Grieber was a spiritualist, heavily involved with the occult. His translation was completed under the direction of 
spirit messengers with the aid of his wife who is a self-professed spirit medium. The willingness of the Watchtower to accept any authority is reflected in the words of Charles Taze Russell in the July 1879 issue of Zion's Watchtower where he stated, A truth presented by Satan himself is just as true as a truth stated by God. Accept truth wherever you find it, no matter what it contradicts. This philosophy is reflected in the New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses. When early Watchtower teachings that the world entered the so-called time of the end in 1799, that Jesus returned invisibly in 1874, and that the world would end in 1914 were proven false. Doctrine was conveniently readjusted. In the new version, 1914 became the date of both Christ's invisible return and the beginning of the time of the end. This date was put forth not as theory or interpretation, but as hard, indisputable fact. Watchtower Society official Eugene Mortensen. All the witnesses from the study of the Bible have firm belief in the fact that since the fall of 1914, Jesus has come into kingdom power. And as he prophesied in the 24th chapter of Matthew, the generation that saw the beginning of this time would not pass away until all things would be accomplished. That means also the end of this wicked system of things. The Watchtower Society is very concerned that time is running out for the so-called generation of 1914. The few who are still living are quite elderly, and should they all pass away before Armageddon, Jehovah's Witnesses will be faced with another false prophecy to explain. Anticipating this future embarrassment, the Chairman's Committee of the Governing Body actually prepared a document suggesting the date be changed from 1914 to 1957. Raymond Franz was a member of the Governing Body when this recommendation was considered. Now, in this document, they suggest and advance as a, an idea that... Uh, the generation that would see the time of the, the uh, end of all things should not be counted from 1914. They fix on Jesus' statement that there would be signs in the heavens. And so they suggest here that the date should be moved up to 1957 when the Sputnik was sent into space by the Russians. And they say, now this is the celestial phenomena that would indicate the generation that would see the final wind-up. The Sputnik idea was ultimately rejected by the governing body, but for the generation of 1914, time is running out. How did the Watchtower arrive at 1914 as an all-important date? Their chronology is based on the year 607 BC, which they claim is the year Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. Carl Olaf Johnson, Swedish author of the book The Gentile Times Reconsidered, is a former Jehovah's Witness elder and pioneer minister. I didn't question this chronology in the beginning because I thought the Bible supported it. I knew, of course, that uh, historians uh, dated the, the desolation of Jerusalem not in 607 but in 587 uh, or 586. But uh, in 1968, I conducted a Bible study with a man who wanted to know why historians, they uh, prefer the date 20 years later. Uh, so I started to investigate the matter. And I soon discovered that um, historians had very strong evidence in their support. Raymond Johnson Trump. compiled his research and sent it to Watchtower headquarters. But the society's leaders were determined to keep their doctrinal system intact. I got the letter with a warning. I was warned that uh, I should not share my findings with uh, other witnesses. To conceal the facts and suppress his seven years of research, the Watchtower Society excommunicated Carl Olaf Johnson. Our teaching on Jesus Christ is that Jesus is the Son of God. He was the first thing that Jehovah created, and uh, through him other creative works were done. 
Now, some religions teach that God and Jesus are one and the same, but the Bible does not teach that, and it, therefore neither do Jehovah's Witnesses. We believe that the Bible teaches that Jesus carries out a number of functions for Jehovah God, the Most High. For example, in the Hebrew Scriptures, he is referred to as Michael. Uh, Michael, literally translated into English, means who is like God. Witnesses believe that Jesus Christ is a spirit creature, a super angel, the first creation of Jehovah God, who prior to coming to earth as a man, existed in heaven as Michael the Archangel. Jesus started out originally as the Logos. Or Michael the Archangel. Who then came to earth as the virgin-born son of Mary. He was a perfect, sinless man. But he was only a man devoid of all divinity. Jesus walked the earth as a man, becoming the Christ only when he was baptized. Jehovah's Witnesses hold the cross in contempt, feeling that it is nothing more than a pagan symbol used by apostate Christendom. Instead, they teach that at the completion of his ministry, Jesus died, not on the cross, but on an upright stake. Christ's body was then laid in a tomb where it was disintegrated by God, totally destroyed forever. Jesus was then recreated by the Father. Before going to heaven, he materialized in different bodies on different occasions to convince his disciples and others that he had really been resurrected. Jesus returned to his Father in heaven where once again he became Michael the Archangel. He will never again be seen on the earth in visible form, but instead rules invisibly from the heavens. When he executes judgment over the world at Armageddon, he will destroy all but the faithful Jehovah's Witnesses. Michael, who will always remain invisible to those on earth, and can be seen only by the 144,000 select Jehovah's Witnesses who rule with him from heaven. If you should choose to accept the Watchtower's current prophecy of Armageddon, whatever that may be, and decide to protect yourself by becoming a Jehovah's Witness, you will find yourself in a unique two-class religion. Only the upper class, the 144,000 spoken of in Revelation, are guaranteed a place in heaven, and they are known as the anointed. The Watchtower Society teaches that the vast majority of Jehovah's Witnesses constitute a secondary group referred to as the other sheep. They have no heavenly hope, but must remain on earth for all eternity. Once a year, on the anniversary of the Last Supper, Jehovah's Witnesses and invited persons gather for this communion-like ceremony. Only members of the anointed class who are alive today, about 9,000 worldwide, partake of the bread and wine. The millions of other sheep will not take communion. The other sheep are not in the new covenant and therefore have no personal relationship with Jesus Christ. How then do they hope to attain salvation? The Jehovah's Witness is told he may not look to Jesus alone for everlasting life. As one of the other sheep, he must also depend on the Watchtower organization for his passage to paradise. In turn, the organization says he's required to earn his salvation largely by calling door to door. It's strange, but they seem able to <clears throat> teach two different things, opposite things, 
simultaneously. They agree that the Bible teaches that we are saved by grace, or as they put it, God's undeserved kindness, and not by works. And yet the average witness believes, he hasn't the slightest doubt, that unless he performs the works that are laid out for him by the Watchtower Society, the witnessing activity, going door to door, uh, regular meeting attendance, and other things that are brought out, that he will never gain everlasting life. Once in the organization, witnesses attend five hours of meetings a week. In addition, they are expected to devote many hours a month going door to door, selling literature and gaining converts, striving always to prove themselves worthy of escaping God's wrath at Armageddon. Even though we, we believe that God was love, we were always afraid that he was going to zap us, that sometime Armageddon might hit and we might not make it. Even if, even if we didn't go out from the door-to-door -door ministry on a weekend and took our family out, uh, out to the lake or something, we didn't go out from door-to-door, -door, we felt guilty all the time. In order to keep a close check on the activities of each member, the organization requires them to turn in a monthly time report if they want to be retained on the rolls as active Jehovah's Witnesses. We don't keep any membership records per se, but uh, the only record we have is those who actually go door to door preaching. Today, when the new Jehovah's Witness is baptized, rather than using the biblical format of baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the witness is baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit-directed organization. This is a dedication to them that is without any reservation. They are now going to set their entire life aside to do their Creator's will. Thus baptized, the Jehovah's Witness is now committed to slave for the organization until the world comes to an end. Jehovah's Witnesses exist in a rigid, structured, thou shalt not environment. They are forbidden to vote or hold elective office, celebrate holidays, belong to the YMCA or YWCA, salute the flag, sing the national anthem, or participate in other patriotic activities. They can't serve in the military or work for a military organization. They may not accept blood transfusions, read anything critical of the Watchtower Society, or associate with former Jehovah's Witnesses. They are forbidden to even attend church. If life is narrow for the adult witness, the problem is greatly intensified for their school-aged children. The Watchtower Society has published a book entitled School and Jehovah's Witnesses. It defines for schools what activities witness children are forbidden to participate in. Things like birthday celebrations, Christmas and Easter, sports, Mother's or Father's Day, Valentine's Day or Thanksgiving, saluting the flag or school dances, singing the national anthem or saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Children are real victims in this. Jehovah's Witness children cannot participate in many of the normal school activities and as a result are often mocked by their classmates. They are really torn because on one hand they want to please their parents and on the other hand they want to be accepted by their teachers and classmates. There is no way they can win. They are literally torn apart emotionally. I know this firsthand because my own daughter cried nearly every day in school from the first time she entered until an extremely loving teacher made her feel at ease in the fourth grade. The life of a witness child is very isolated because playing with non-witness schoolmates and neighborhood children is considered bad association. The Watchtower Society presents Jehovah's Witnesses as clean, happy, and unquestionably moral. 
The Bible has a lot to say about family life, and the reason Jehovah's Witnesses have such happy families is because we try to apply the principles that are found in the Bible. This protects them from many of the pressures and the problems that afflict a family life today. For example, Jehovah's Witnesses, while not immune to the pressures and problems, are able to cope with the difficulties that husbands and wives face, that children are confronted with every day. And so we have a very low incidence of family dissolving or juvenile delinquency, drug abuse, and alcoholism. And that shows the benefit and the profit of following God's word closely. Former Jehovah's Witnesses disagree. Growing up as a child within Jehovah's Witnesses, I always thought that this was God's clean organization. But when I got older, I found out that there were divorces, there was gross immorality within the congregations, and that we were actually no different than the ones we were condemning. As an elder, I saw the seedy side of the congregation. Members would come to me with their problems, and I found out that even elders were involved sometimes in crooked business practices and in immorality. And I began to discover that we were really no better than the people on the outside of the organization. When I left Bethel, it was hard for me to even share with my mother and father what was going on up there, the, the drunken parties that went on and, and the homosexuality and things like this. Finally, the Watchtower had to admit that immorality had spread to the highest levels of the organization, saying, shocking as it is, even some who have been prominent in Jehovah's organization have succumbed to immoral practices, including homosexuality, wife swapping, and child molesting. Alcoholism, depression, and mental disorders among Jehovah's Witnesses have come to the attention of psychiatric professionals. Dr. Jerry Bergman is a former Jehovah's Witness and a trained psychologist. In my experience in working for a number of psychiatric clinics as a therapist, I've worked with many, many Jehovah's Witnesses, and I find that many of them suffer from severe emotional problems, from schizophrenia, from severe depression, alcoholism, and other problems. I've also consulted the scientific literature on this question, and I found that it clearly confirms that the mental illness rate among the witnesses is clearly above average. One of the most intimidating devices used by the Watchtower Society is the threat of appearing before a judicial committee of elders. Public censure, even disfellowshipping, can be the sentence of this powerful court. The inflexibility of Watchtower policies has led to thousands of instances of mental distress, even suicide. Dottie Hike's family experienced the cold steel of Watchtower doctrine when her 16-year-old son Billy became romantically involved with a married Jehovah's Witness woman. Conscience-stricken, Billy turned to his parents. He was very upset, extremely distraught, and he just didn't know what to do. And he was making statements like, I just can't go on, I just can't face this. And he was threatening to commit suicide. My husband and I talked with him for hours and did everything and said everything we knew to do to try to get him to realize that there's no situation too bad that you can't face. But things just were not getting any better. So as witnesses, you're taught not to seek the professional help of anyone. So we felt our hands were so tied we didn't know what to do. The family turned to an elder of the congregation for help. The elder called Billy outside, and his parents felt a solution was near. But their hopes were short-lived. We felt the elder would really have some kind of words of consolation for him, even though no one condoned what he had done. This boy was reaching out for help, and he did need someone to console him. And he felt so guilty, and so at a loss. And instead, the elder just said, the committee will deal with you tomorrow. He went out to my husband's truck, where he kept a small amount of Paraquat in a container. And Billy took the Paraquat, and he took one swallow of it. We had him in the hospital within 20 minutes. Exactly three weeks later, he died. <laughs> Did 
the witness congregation respond with compassion to this tragedy? Billy's sister, Rhonda. When he died, it really devastated me. At his memorial service, none of his friends that he'd known all of his life were able to attend, and that really hurt me. The Jehovah's Witnesses claim to bring the families together. Through them, my brother killed himself. My mother tried to kill herself. My two sisters and my brother will not speak to me. My grandmother will not speak to me. She wouldn't let me see my grandfather before he passed away. They didn't bring our family close together. They nearly, totally destroyed it. While the members of the governing body may escape blame for the death of one desperate boy, they can hardly escape responsibility for their policies in the African country of Malawi. Policies that left thousands of witnesses raped, homeless, or dead. In the mid-1960s, in the African country of Malawi, all citizens were ordered by the government to purchase a 25-cent party identification card. Jehovah's Witnesses were forbidden by the Watchtower Society's branch office from complying with that law. As a result, Jehovah's Witnesses suffered a terrible persecution. Homes and crops were burned. Thousands of women were raped and some 20,000 witnesses were forced to flee Malawi into neighboring countries to live in refugee camps, their lives scarred forever. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, are taught that it's a sin to be involved in any way with politics. They're also taught that it's just as great a sin to have anything to do with the military. But we have two situations, one in a country in Africa, Malawi, and another in Mexico, where two opposite rulings were allowed to stay in effect at the same time, and it's almost unbelievable, the, the results of this. When Jehovah's Witnesses living in Mexico heard that their brothers had suffered this terrible persecution over a 25-cent party card, they were conscience-stricken. Because in Mexico, every young man is expected to fulfill one year of military service. He receives what's called a cartilla, a certificate. The witnesses customarily and regularly would bribe a military official to fill out this card stating that they had completed their military instruction and that they were now in the first reserves of the army. Why were they doing this? They gave me copies of letters from the Watchtower Society's headquarters in New York stating that this was purely a matter for individual conscience and that if the person felt he could do this, pay a bribe to a military official, get this card saying he had completed his military training and was now a member of the First Reserves, this was up to him. Jehovah's Witnesses believe the men who make up the governing body are chosen and directed by God. Yet out of apparent indifference or ignorance or worse, the governing body allowed witnesses to illegally bribe officials while at the same time holding others to a policy that resulted in their wholesale rape and slaughter. It's difficult for me to believe these actions were inspired by God. The controlled tentacles of the governing body extend even into the life and death world of medical treatment. In the 17th chapter of Leviticus in the 10th verse, it states that one should not eat blood of any sort this means that God does not want us to sustain our life off of the life of some other creature. And that for that reason, because God has forbidden it, we abstain from taking blood. The blood issue in the back of our minds was bothering us because as Jehovah's Witnesses, if we freely gave a blood transfusion to our daughter, we'd be excommunicated, we'd be disfellowshipped. Well, the doctors finally came to our room and they just it was just like an ultimatum. They said, listen, we know from our records that you're a Jehovah's Witness. We know that you don't take blood transfusions. And the doctor looked me straight in the eye and said, Mr. and Mrs. Blizzard, you have to make a decision, yes or no, whether your child lives or dies. I remember going over to the bed, and she had these cords and wires keeping her alive, life support systems, and, and holding this limp child that was our only daughter, and, and, and just going over to the window and looking out and watching the clouds and the sky and, and just started to weep. And I said, oh God, Jehovah, and I prayed to Jehovah. We just had a real distinct impression that we were supposed to obey God's law and go by what we had always been taught and that we were to let our daughter die. And so we just called the doctors back in and told them 
that we had just had to let her die, that we had to obey God's law. About a half an hour later, a sheriff deputy came to our room and gave my wife and I both citations, and they told us that a court order has already been issued, uh, your daughter is going to get the blood, and they also warned the staff of the hospital not to allow us to take Jenny out of the hospital. And we were charged with child neglect and abuse. The witnesses, there was multitudes of them that came up to the room, just swarmed the room, tried to give them a, giving us Watchtower articles about uh, artificial blood, and, and uh, you just can't let your child take that blood, and just putting this heavy guilt trip on us. The elders were relieved to find out that there was still time to get Jenny out of the hospital, and they would, they would come up to me and say, hey, I've got a plan. We can get her, we can hire a helicopter, we can sneak her out of this hospital, just unhook the tubes, and, and we're gone. And I said, wait a minute. You can't do that. It's against, it's against the law. I'll be charged with murder. They said, that's a chance you're going to have to take. And I just told them, look, I just can't let my child die in that way. And the elders were just so upset. They left in a huff. They were mad. And one of the elders said on the way out, he looked me in the eye and said, you know what? I hope your daughter gets hepatitis from that blood. And that was just the straw that broke the camel's back. I was just broken here. My own people. God's organization turning against me, cursing me, because I just wanted to see my child live. And so they left. And we were all alone. Even my own parents didn't come see us. I think many times Jehovah's Witnesses have really never thought the blood thing through. It's either right or it's wrong. If it's wrong, the Watchtower Society is guilty of causing the deaths of thousands of people. That's wrong. It's evil. I think the evil needs to be seen for what it is. It's this concept, this organizational concept, that the organization is everything. You see, <clears throat> Jehovah's Witnesses believe that this organization is God's one channel, that all of God's direction for people on the earth comes through this channel. And the men on the governing body believe it. I believed it. And that's the reason I was party to some things in the past that today I, I feel shame to think that I even had part in them. If the governing body of the Watchtower Society holds and enjoys the power, then they must also bear the responsibility. The truth is, they don't. Nothing better illustrates this than their false prophecy concerning 1975. Well, when the society brought out the date 1975, I felt right away that th this is going to be the date when the thing has to happen because there was no other date beyond 1975 that anybody could point to. So uh, I grabbed right a hold of it. It was, just, it was a thing to do, and uh, I put all my hopes in it. By the mid-60s, the Watchtower Society had all but guaranteed that the world would come to an end in 1975. It was a prophecy that would bring in a flood of new members, and the organization prospered. But it would have other effects on the ordinary Jehovah's Witness. We thought Armageddon was coming in 1975. So I did not have a career. I didn't go to college because the end was so close. There was no need. The new world would be here. Uh, I was a senior in high school, and the circuit overseer, which is a traveling minister, advised me that it's best for you to quit school and go into full-time pioneer work because the world is going to end in 1975. And we felt so strongly about the imminent approach of 1975 and that this whole system was coming to an end that we sold our home in lower Michigan, moved north, built a kingdom hall, and there we intended to live out those few remaining years, having saved just enough money to go a few years beyond 1975. And so it was a great disappointment and distress when this event was that the Watchtower had prophesied did not materialize. I wanted to get married, I wanted to have children, but because the end was so close, when Fred and I got married, we decided that we would postpone having children. So I believe we sacrificed a lot within the organization. Well, when the end of the world didn't come in 1975, and that prophecy of the Watchtower failed, I begin to wonder if they were wrong on this, how many others are they wrong on? And once again, Watchtower fact was revealed as nothing more than contrived fantasy. Jehovah's Witnesses tried to get an explanation, but were unsuccessful. Apparently, for the governing body, nothing is so invisible as an unpleasant truth. Today, 
they are quick to deny their prophecies for the end of the world. We do not, nor have we attempted, to predict a day or a time for it. The history and prophecies of the Watchtower Society are easily revealed as fabrications and distortions by simply reading the material they've published from the beginning. Their greatest enemy is their own literature, which clearly shows the man-made nature of their theology. Jehovah's Witness leaders have continually covered up and rewritten their ever-changing doctrines, each time presenting them as new light. The one thing the Watchtower Society cannot tolerate in the organization is critical thinking. That's why they forbid their followers to read any material which might expose their deceptions. really shocked me to my core was this, and every other Jehovah's Witness listening to this, is that we were so convinced that the leadership, the governing body, would never tell one lie. Mm -hmm. They would always speak the truth, yes. no matter what the truth was. Mm -hmm. That is a fabrication. It is a lie. They have lied to us. They have deceived us. And we have the documented evidence. And because we've spoken about it, we were silenced or threatened to be silenced. And that's what will happen to any Jehovah's Witness listening to this program. And he knows it in his heart. He knows it in his heart. I saw in the body that most of our time was spent discussing the formation of new rulings, all designed to keep the witnesses in and to keep bad people out, to act as that kind of offense. And again and again, the decisions had absolutely no basis in the Bible. The witness who breaks these executive commandments is subject to disfellowshipping. The Watchtower's word for excommunication. Jehovah's Witnesses practice removing those who refuse to conform to right principles from among themselves. The Bible refers to this and supports this practice as preventing leaven or false thinking or teaching from entering into the congregation, thereby maintaining its purity or its cleanliness. I went to a Christian church with my husband, and they disfellowshipped me for that. They believe that when you, when you become, uh, when you leave the organization, you go to the devil anyway, but if you ever join a church, this is the ultimate sin. They believe that it's committing spiritual fornication with the devil. In my uh, job assignment at the, the Brooklyn Bethel headquarters, I would often process disfellowshippings which came in from all the various congregations in the United States, and they literally amounted to hundreds that would come in every week. It just shows the, the magnitude of the number of people that are disfellowshipped by the organization. And, of course, careful records are kept on all of this, and, and including all the, the intimate details of uh, what the individual did, what kind of offense it was. Mainly they are sex offenses, but there are other offenses, too, like uh, smoking, uh, perhaps celebrating the holidays, uh, things like that, that people also got disfellowshipped for. If uh, one uh, actually becomes a dissenter to the point of becoming apostate, then we follow the Bible counsel and we uh, never invite him into our house or would say a greeting to him. If a person resigns, they are treated exactly the same as a person who is disfellowshipped. When my husband and I resigned by sending in a letter of disassociation, we were not merely dropped from membership. We were actually shunned as being evil. Even today, if a Jehovah's Witness is caught associating with us, they are subject to being disfellowshipped themselves. There is no honorable way out of this religion. Because of the way that they had treated my family, I disassociated myself from the Watchtower Society, never dreaming that my children would refuse to have anything to do with me. In fact, I have a little two-year-old grandson that I've never even seen. My two children and my five grandchildren are forbidden to see me, their grandmother, because of the Watchtower. What kind of organization, going under the heading of Christian, would disallow the children and grandchildren to see their mother and grandmother? Every person will recognize the Watchtower's practice of shunning as a cold, unloving, evil thing. The lives of the disfellowshipped are filled with the chill of loneliness the never-ending sadness of separation from family members. To find something to believe in, to trust in, is very hard. Since I believed that they were the only channel to God, I couldn't bring myself to come to any other church, to search for God in any other way. 
Normally, Jehovah's Witnesses are taught that when they leave the organization, there's nowhere to go. But my wife and I, through Bible reading, found out that we could go to Christ. And that's what we have done. After I'd ran across some literature that exposed their false prophecies and their deceitful ways of covering them up, I then was able to realize that they weren't God's organization and I was able to search for God. And I found Jesus Christ and He is my personal Savior and He's changed my life just a hundred percent. We just uh, prayed and gave our heart to Jesus and it seemed like such it was such a simple answer but that was that was what we've been searching for all our life and it wasn't an organization it was Jesus it was a personal relationship with Jesus that we didn't have before we knew at that very moment that our names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life it was it was a free gift eternal life just given to us and all those works that we did all the thousands of hours that we that we put in for an organization all the hard striving was finished and just grace, just grace saved us through faith, just a simple act of obedience and prayer and asking the Lord to take over. And it just filled us with joy and peace, a joy that we never had, never had as a witness. Marjorie and I spent many years working for the Watchtower Society, but it wasn't until we left the organization that we discovered the real meaning of God's love. Our experience says to us that there's another ministry out there for Christians, a ministry that will come knocking on their door. The Jehovah's Witness who comes to your door is a person who's lost his way. If you're prepared, you can reach out and show him what true Christian fellowship is. It's been a long journey for us, but we don't think it's been wasted. The remainder of our years are going to be all the more precious to us because now, we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We finally came to realize that eternal life is a free gift. God's grace was all we needed. Just grace. Sean, I have long been interested in Galatians 1.6. Galatians 1.6 says this, uh, just to let you know. It says, I marvel, Paul writes, that you were so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and that would pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul continues, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And then he repeats it. As I said before, so I now say again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you other than that which you have received, let him be accursed. Brad makes this point. He says, uh, I've always found it quite strange that the two biggest organizations of Christianity namely Islam and the LDS, are both based on claims of another gospel being given by an angel. In both cases, an angel appears and tells somebody, Muhammad and Joseph Smith, that the Bible is corrupt and there's a new book that is better. In both cases, the new teaching removes salvation through faith and a system of works is instilled in its place. In both cases, Jesus' true nature is refuted, and he is made less than the Christ. What are your thoughts on this? I absolutely concur. Absolutely. The cults always uh, do those things, and the false religions will always be another gospel that preach another gospel. So, great point, Brad. Really appreciate There's something really amazing in my Diet Coke. I... It's giving me some kind of message right now. <laughs> Just kidding. We'll be, we'll be back to talk about these. Last week, we showed you the two verifiable methods by which the founding prophet of Mormonism, Joseph Smith, translated the golden plates. The first one was by a rock in the hat. Remember, we talked about that. 
And the second one was through what Joseph Smith said came in the box, stone box with the plates. And he said it was a Urim and Thummim. And he wore this, he said that this breastplate was put on and then the glasses were there. And then he would look at the plates and his mom said by doing that, he could translate ancient languages into English. So those are the two means by which Joseph Smith uh, translated the uh, Book of Mormon. Let's talk about the actual translation tonight. At this juncture, ask yourself this. Was the Book of Mormon a literal translation of an ancient language written on golden plates, or, listen carefully, or was it a spiritual transmission given by God to Joseph who didn't need any of these things to produce the book. It just came by revelation to Joseph and he dictated the story. Stay with me. If the Book of Mormon was a literal translation, that means Joseph looked at the inscribed characters through his glasses and he actually said, okay, that mark means, and it came to pass. And so they'd write, and it came to pass. I, Nephi, haven't been born of goodly parents. And then the scribe writes that if that's how it was translated, then we can attribute the mistakes that were in the first vision, I mean the first edition of the Book of Mormon, to him. Uh, even if the Urim and Thummim was aiding him, it was his problem because he was actually doing the translating. However, if the Book of Mormon was translated by direct revelation, meaning from God's mouth to Joseph's ear, then the problems and the mistakes in the first edition were God's fault. See, translators can make mistakes. Bible translators make mistakes. They take the text, they look at it, they use all their knowledge, and they translate it into another language. In the case of the Bible, there have been thousands and thousands of trained hands and eyes and ears of men and women who understand the languages, they have looked at the manuscripts that have been handed down, and they can check on each other, double check on translated words, and make improvements to the text. With the aid and guide of the Holy Spirit working upon these men and women who are trained in these languages and cultures of the Hebrews and the Greeks, we have a living example of how God works with humanity. This is how he works. He works through his influence, the Holy Spirit, and he works through flesh and blood doing things, okay? That's how God works. And this method is supported by the very fact that he saved mankind through a real flesh and blood manifestation of himself, Jesus Christ. He didn't save us by some mystical metaphysical means. He saved us by a literal way, coming here, living among us, dying for us. It's spiritual, 100% God, and physical, 100% man. And so that's how God works. But when men start transmitting books via mystical means, uh, through inspirations and dreams and visions and having revelations and automatic writings and divine uh, revelations, like supposedly Muhammad did when he was in the cave, or uh, William Case I think that was his name, had when he would go into trances or Joseph Smith would get when he was receiving his revelation for the Book of Mormon, then we have products of men, not of God. So how did Joseph produce the Book of Mormon, really? As a child and a teen and an adult, the Mormon Corporation and all their devoted employees led me to believe it occurred through the means God provided. Through the golden plates being on a table and Joseph taking the Urim and Thummim, and reading the engravings through them and translating it into English. Look at Colson. This is the recent ensign. Look at this picture. This picture depicts what I just said they teach. It's Joseph sitting at a table. He's looking at the golden plates. And down here, there are, down here are his writings. So they make it look to us like this is how the Book of Mormon came to be. Uh, listen carefully. The things God supposedly provided, the golden plates, the supposed Urim and Thummim that God provided for the translation uh, of the Book of Mormon were not part of creating the book at all. At all. 
This is absolutely true. All the time and trouble Mormon and Moroni supposedly went to and others to inscribe upon metal plates, vast amounts of them, and then condense them down into an abridged version on golden plates, never used. All the craftsmanship Jesus supposedly went to 600 years BC to create these, to give them to this, uh, this uh, brother of Jared who passed them down through the Book of Mormon to finally be put in the box and given to Joseph Smith, never used. They're never used. Why? They were props, my friend. And Joseph made them up as he went. And when, he, when they became unnecessary, he didn't even use them. He didn't even bother to. Anyone involved in sales or teaching or marketing knows that when you're preparing to do something, you'll make props, aids, to try to help facilitate in what you're going to do. And sometimes you find out that the prop you have made does, causes more trouble and does less for you than good, and so you don't even use the thing you made. Okay, now we have a living example of that right here. When I started out to embark on... on uh, doing the Mormon thing, I went to uh, Kinko's and I had these made. This is cultivating religious fraud. That's the first one. These things were fairly expensive to tell you the truth. And then I laid out all the stuff that we were going to do over here. And then I did another one showing you the onion for the Book of Mormonian. And then I did another one over here showing how we we're going to break down the Book of Mormon and study it. And you know what? I've only used these things in 26 weeks about three times. The first one, I don't even use. It's a, it was a waste of like 70 bucks. I mean, that's how much it costs to do it. But in my mind, I thought, I'm going to need these to really help people see what I'm doing. But when it came down to it, they, I never used them. I mean, I'm going to very rarely use them. This is a living example of what Joseph did. He told a story. He needed props. As the story moved along, the props became useless. He was behind a curtain, probably holding these up for the first week, looking around. I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents, starts picking his ear. Yeah, I'm not putting this on anymore. I mean, that's exactly how it went. You think I'm making it up, don't you? Well, let me prove to you I'm not. It's acceptable when we're making a sales presentation or we're trying to teach to have props we don't use. It's not acceptable when someone says, God had these things handed down to him. An angel revealed where they were. He had to wait four years to get them. And then when he gets them, supposedly, he doesn't ever need them. Um, this is exactly what happened to Joseph Smith. He never used them. And he ended up translating, supposedly translating, the entire Book of Mormon through two means. One, a rock that he used to hunt for treasure with his dad and that he used to find the plates themselves as attested by historical statements last week in a hat dictating what the book should say. I believe that in that hat he had his crib sheet and he had his outline for the day and he was smart enough to know what the story was going to be. He talked when you read other uh, quotes from Joseph Smith of the same time when he was supposedly translating the Book of Mormon, the quotes that he gave just about common everyday things were very much in Book of Mormon language. He would talk like he was actually in the Book of Mormon times writing. This is how the Book of Mormon was translated and or by standing there and having it revealed to him directly. If you don't believe me, let me end and give you some quotes. Joseph uh, David Whitmer, one of the eight witnesses of the plate said, quote, he did not use the plates in the translation, but would hold the interpreters to his eyes and cover his face with a hat. Joseph Smith's good friend Joseph Knight said, quote, now the way he translated was he put the Urim and Thummim, and he was referring to the rock there, into his hat and darkened his eyes. Then he would take a sentence and it would appear in the bright Roman letters. Then he would tell the writer and he would write it. Then that would go away. The next sentence would come and go, and so on. Spelling was correct. But if it was not spelt right, it would not go away till it was true. So we see it was marvelous. This was the whole translated, meaning this was how the whole thing was translated. 
By this means, you got to understand from that quote, Joseph read and the words wouldn't go away until they were correct. And then they would continue and go on. In Doctrine and Covenants uh, section 17, God himself says in a revelation to Joseph that the book is true. True means dead on. Now, when we start reading from the first edition, you're going to have a hard time believing what God translated to Joseph through the letters that appeared and, uh, and wouldn't disappear unless it was written correctly. BYU professor Nels L. Nelson said this, listen, Joseph Smith did not look directly at the plates while translating. In fact, the plates, while they were in possession of the prophet, were probably not immediately at hand with him during most of the translation process. All the time in trouble, and they weren't even there. Two LDS scholars, Van Wagner and Walker, concluded the prophet, his face in a hat to exclude exterior light, would have been unable to view the plates directly, even if they had been with him and present during the interpretation. Essentially, they were saying the plates were never used. The plates weren't used. It was too much trouble. They were too heavy. He created them. They were too cumbersome. People wanted them. He hid them away, got his rock, got his hat, had his outline he had worked on for about six years, and he produced a book, and the first edition shows it was the product of man. We know that well before Joseph even got the plates, that he had in his mind what things were all about. Remember what his mother said? Listen, quote, Joseph would occasionally give us some of the most amusing recitals that could be imagined. He would describe the ancient inhabitants of their continent, their dress, mode of traveling, and the animals upon which they rode, their cities, their buildings, and with particular their mode of warfare and also their religious worship. This he would do with much ease, seemingly as if he had spent his whole life among them. That was well before he ever received the golden plates. Speaking of Smith's ability to translate without using the plates, Richard C. Evans, a longtime member of the, LD, of the first presidency of the reorganized LDS Church, now called the Community of Christ, who believe in the Book of Mormon, said, quote, This is evidently why Smith did not require the plates to be in his hat when he translated, but they could lie covered up on a table or even be in the woods when he did the job, as testified by his wife Emma and her father Isaac Hales, who tells of his talking through his hat. And what was in his hat? I told you what was in his hat was this rock that supposedly led him to the plates and to buried treasure. Joseph Smith said in History of the Church that the Book of Mormon is the most correct of any book on earth. Listen, the only conclusion we can come to here, looking and hearing at all these facts uh, about his transmission, not his translation. He wasn't looking at plates. He received it by virtue of osmosis, is that God messed up. God gave him the wrong words in places that were later changed. He gave him the wrong spelling. He gave him the wrong everything. 3,976, I think, changes that Sandra and Gerald Tanner found, and many more or less in other places. Some, many of them, not punctuation. God translated this, said in Doctrine and Covenants 17, the book is true. He messed up in telling Joseph what to say. And if the letters actually did show up in a hat, he messed up by God's spelling was off because the, the, this supposedly didn't change until it was written down correctly. I mean, we got a whole bunch of problems here. And this is the book that they, that they, that they do whole magazines on and put them out there all about the Book of Mormon that Apostle Holland gets up and says it's just this miraculous book. It is not. It's a con. And it's an introductory drug to a false gospel. Result. There's only a handful of passages in the Book of Mormonian that conflict with the Bible, while the remaining doctrine simply echoes tradi traditional 19th century uh, theology. Few people realize this, but this is how the Book of Mormon is used by Mormon missionaries to convince people. They're not astute in the Bible. The Mormon missionaries come, they give them the Book of Mormon, and it's like bait to a fish. And so they open it up and they're reading biblical passages and they're reading biblical ideas. And so they think, wow, it sounds really good. And they say, a 14-year-old boy, which wasn't true, came up with that. It's a miracle. Book must be true. Church must be true. I'll join. The hook is set. The fish is in there. And then they fry you in the pan and they offer you up for the rest of your life to a false god. So 
To top it all off, Joseph Book of Mormon actually opposes, even contradicts many LDS teachings and doctrines today. So tonight we are going to go through some of those and point them out to you. Now, remember, in terms of doctrine, the Book of Mormon was primarily a product that reflects 19th century Christianity and that the Book of Mormon teaches doctrines that are counter to the LDS teachings today. Remember this? Here we go. Number one, Mormonism today teaches that God was once a man. Prior to his death, Mormon founder Joseph Smith said, We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute the idea and take away the veil so that you may see. However, in his Book of Mormon, which he started off with, it preaches Christian doctrine. It says in Moroni 7.22, God knows all things from everlasting to everlasting. Moroni 8.18, God is unchangeable from eternity to eternity. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and in him there is no variableness that a man would have, Mormon 9.9. And in 3 Nephi 24.6, it says, I am the Lord, I change not. These are biblical teachings. This came straight from the Bible, this idea, right into the Book of Mormon. The second thing, Mormon leaders and their manual have taught directly and repeatedly that Jesus was not conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary, but it was through a relationship with God the Father who is in a body of flesh and bone. That eliminates the, the biblical idea of virgin birth. LDS Apostle Bruce R. McConkie said, Quote, Jesus was begotten by his father as literally as he was conceived by his mother. Doctrine, uh, doctrinal New Testament commentary. But the Book of Mormon teaches the biblical position. It says Mary shall be overshadowed and conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost. That's in Alma 7.10, a traditional biblical teaching. Third, in one of Joseph Smith's later revelations, he says in Doctrine and Covenants 130, verse 3, that the idea that the father uh, and son dwell in a man's heart is, quote, an old sectarian notion. Mormons do not believe that Jesus dwells in your heart, even though the Bible teaches that he does. But Alma 34, 36 says, The Lord has said he dwelleth not in unholy temples, but in the heart of the righteous does he dwell. So another biblical tenet preached in the Book of Mormon, not believed by Mormons today, and actually refuted by LDS leaders and teachers in their manuals and, and writings. Mormonism teaches that there are many gods with a capital G. LDS apostle Boyd K. Packer said in a recent past, anyone who believes and teaches of God the Father and accepts the divinity of Christ and of the Holy Ghost teaches a plurality of gods. That's the LDS stance. If you believe in God the Father and Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost and that their deity, you believe in a plurality of gods. You're a polytheist. That's a plurality of gods. But in the Book of Mormon, uh, it refutes Packer's statement. Listen to this. Book of Mormon, Alma 11 says, is there more than one God? And he answered, no. In uh, 3 Nephi 11, the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are one. In, in Moroni, uh, Mormon 7.7, 7, the Father and unto the Son and unto the Holy Ghost, which are one God. One God. Not a plurality, Boydie. Boydie K. Not a plurality. Go back to your little house there, your 1.3 million, and go research plurality of God, you pagan. But I'm sorry, it's not a plurality. There's one God, Boyd, Apostle Boyd. One God. Okay, and then in Alma 11:44 it says, "Christ the Son, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit, which is one eternal God." Okay, so again, the Mormon, a Book of Mormon, lays it out for people to hook them, but along comes Boydy and changes things around in their mind. Mormonism today would never, ever, ever pray to Jesus. Well, listen to Joseph's work of fiction aimed at creating a new Christian Bible. It says in 3 Nephi, And behold, they began to pray, and they did pray unto Jesus, calling him their Lord and their God. This is straight from the pulpits of a Christian. 
church. This is what Joseph Smith saw as a young man. This is what he included in his Book of Mormon. Mormons today make fun of the Christian idea of worshiping and glorifying God forever. They will often say to Christians, well, what are you going to do for eternity? Sit on a cloud and play a harp? I mean, they make fun of us because we don't know what's going to happen in the eternities while they think they do. But listen to the Christian sounding idea Joseph put in the Book of Mormon. It says, the self-same end has he, God, created them, men, listen, that they should glorify him forever. That's in Jacob 2.21. This is a line straight from the Christian community in which Joseph, to glorify God forever, that's from Christian mouths, my friends. The Latter-day Saints reject the idea of hell. Even to the point that on this Barbara Walters clip we're going to show you, we have this LDS guy saying, everybody's going to go to heaven, Barbara. Everybody. Barbara Walters says, am I going to go to heaven? He says, yeah, of course you're going to go to heaven. Because the Mormons today, they reject the idea of hell. But uh, LDS 10th President Joseph Fielding Smith said, quote, we do not believe that hell is a place where the wicked are being burned forever. And Apostle uh, John A. Widstow wrote, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, there is no hell. Okay, but the Book of Mormon clearly teaches the Christian doctrine, and it says, quote, if the church is built upon the works of men, they are hewn down and cast into the fire from whence there is no return. The Mormons say that's not true. There's no eternal hell. There's no fire. That's not what that says. And in classic Christian speech, Second Nephi, Jesus, for he has redeemed my soul from hell. And Second Nephi 1.19, God delivered the saints from hell. Here's some more to endless misery to inherit the kingdom of the devil. Endless misery is a concept of eternal hell. Into hell that hath no end, 1 Nephi 14.3. Listen to this. Oh, the greatness of the mercy of God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has delivered his saints from that awful monster, the devil, and that lake of fire and brimstone and endless torment. Endless torment, my friends. That's in the Book of Mormon. Fire and brimstone. Why? Because Joseph Smith copied it from the Christian tenets. And later, when he got a following, he went berserk and started talking about no hell and no uh, literal God. This rhetoric is straight out of 19th century revivals. One, a couple more. And listen to this. Listen to how this sounds. And now, my beloved brethren, can ye be puffed up in pride in your hearts, setting your hearts upon the vain things of the world? They, these are they who shall be hewn down and cast into the fire. Listen to this one. Talking about a woman in the Book of Mormon. She stood upon her feet and cried with a loud voice, Oh, blessed Jesus, who has saved me from an awful hell. Oh, blessed God, have mercy on this people. If I were to read some of these passages and you didn't know the Bible, you would think these passages came straight from the Bible. It's a total counterfeit. Mormonism today teaches the lie that people will have a chance to hear the gospel after this life. In 2004, Manual of the Mormon Church, page 52, it reads, In the spirit world, the gospel is preached to those who did not obey the gospel or have had the opportunity to hear it while on earth, end quote. But the Book of Mormon, speaking of all who die, says, They are righteous. They who are righteous shall be righteous still. They who are filthy, filthy still. And Alma 12, uh, 27 plainly states the biblical stance saying, there is a time appointed unto men that they must die, and after death must come judgment. Book of Mormon teaches biblical principles, but uh, doesn't give it credit. Mormonism today teaches that Adam's disobedience was a good thing, that it, it's a praiseworthy thing, and that it was good that he was disobedient to God's commandment. LDS President Joseph Fielding Smith, quoted in the Ensign Magazine in 2006, said, so don't let us, brethren and sisters, complain about Adam and wish he hadn't done something that he did. I want to thank him. You want to thank him for all the suffering and pain. Really good there, old prophet Smith. Anyway, uh, the Book of Mormon teaches the biblical truth, making it clear that, that God does not give dual commandments. He doesn't give a commandment so that people don't know how to obey it or can't obey it. The Book of Mormon literally says, The Lord gives no commandment unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them that they may accomplish the thing which he had commanded them. It's plain and simple, but the Mormon teaching on the fall changes that. And Mormonism today, because of Joseph Smith's later ideas, it teaches the exaltation of man. I'm not going to cover that. 
Mormonism, uh, t Mormon teaches today that we're not to worship the sun. Jesus Christ. Uh, I vividly remember Bruce R. McConkie saying in the Marriott Center at Brigham Young University, I was there, quote, we worship the Father and Him only and no one else. We do not worship the Son. We do not worship the Holy Ghost. But again, the Book of Mormon presents the Christian view. Listen, I bet you didn't know that it said this in the Book of Mormon. They did fall down at the feet of Jesus and worshiped Him. That's in the Book of Mormon. Speaking of Jesus, 2 Nephi 25, 29 says, Wherefore, you must doubt, bow down before him, Jesus, and worship him with your whole soul. Mormons don't teach this. They do not worship Jesus today. They don't believe that. That's not even in their vernacular. Okay. And, of course, polygamy uh, justified to the point that Brigham Young said, The only men who become gods, even the sons of God, are those who enter into polygamy. End quote. But the Book of Mormon renounces polygamy. It says in it, Behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was abominable, thus saith the Lord. And yet Mormonism continues to practice it secretly today. Next week we're going to continue on with more of this, but we're going to talk about soteriology, which is saved by grace, being uh, not able to save yourself, and the grace of Christ coming in and saving you in the Book of Mormon. Hey, let's open up the phone line. Read how the Book of Mormon describes the nature of man, the cleansing blood of Christ, grace, works, spiritual rebirth, and salvation, relative to how Mormons see these concepts today. So why don't we start off by talking about the general nature of man. Brigham Young said, We are the sons and daughters of celestial beings, and the germ of deity dwells within us. When our spirits took possession of these tabernacles, they were as pure as the angels of God. Wherefore, total depravity cannot be a true doctrine. Uh, LDS Apostle John Widstow said, God and man are of the same race, differing only in their degrees of advancement. And then Hugh B. Brown, member of the LDS First Presidency, said, We proclaim the spiritual and inspiring doctrine that man should look up and not down for his source. For he is of divine lineage, that man is innocent at birth, which is the antithesis of the ball and chain doctrine of original sin and innate wickedness. So yet the Book of Mormon, written well before Joseph Smith led himself to more advanced doctrine, so to speak, it says things that are quite different. In Alma 30:25, it says that people are guilty, a fallen people, because of the transgression of a parent. That means of Adam. In 2 Nephi 2:21, it says, and showed all men that they are lost because of the transgression of their parents. Messiah 3.19 says, For the natural man is an enemy to God and has been from the fall of Adam. How is, being, how is a being who is born supposedly innocent and a child of God an enemy of God at the same time? Book of Mormon teaches enemy of God. Christianity teaches enemy of God. But yet Mormon apostles and prophets today say, no, 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 we're all children of God. Born innocent, pure as a driven snow, etc., etc. What's happened? How did this occur? Messiah also teaches all mankind is carnal, sensual, devilish, subjecting themselves to the devil. This is pure Christian uh, teachings. Uh, Helaman 14, 16 teaches that all mankind due to the fall is spiritually dead. And it actually uses that phrase, spiritually dead. Uh, and Alma 22, 14, echoing that man is spiritually dead, says, says, since man had fallen, he could not merit anything of himself. This is totally contrary to how LDS paint the picture of man today and women today when they're born in this earth. The Book of Mormon is teaching an absolutely Christian ideal here. We're going to tell you why in a minute. And then finally, Messiah 27, 25 to 26 says that a man must be born again, born of God, changed from the carnal and fallen state to a state of righteousness, becoming new creatures. Sounds like that stuff came right out of the Bible, doesn't it? Right from one of the million Christian pulpits that had existed over the ages teaching things like this. Finally, Helaman 14.6 says, All mankind being cut off from the presence of the Lord are as dead. That is the Christian doctrine. We are born, born uh, dead 
to him. We are dead because of Adam's uh, sin. And it is only through spiritual regeneration that we are reunited in that relationship as his children. Prior to that, we are just creatures. The LDS Church renounces that today. So it's clear that Joseph Smith's Book of Mormonian taught the biblical idea that because of Adam, humanity was born in sin, having no merit before God and spiritually dead. These teachings are lost in present-day Mormonism. What happened? We're going to tell you in just a minute. So now, how does Mormonism uh, today present the solution to sin in humanity? What do they say? It certainly isn't through the blood of Jesus. When I was a kid, the LDS prophet Spencer W. Kimball wrote, wrote in perhaps the worst book ever written in the history of man called The Miracle of Forgiveness. Spencer W. Kimball wrote, one of the most fallacious doctrines originated by Satan and propounded by man is that man is saved alone by the grace of God. That belief in Jesus alone is all that is needed for salvation. That was the Mormon prophet when I was a kid. You wonder why I get kind of heated sometimes. LDS apostle Bruce R. McConkie said, the second greatest heresy in Christendom is that men are saved by grace alone without works, merely by confessing the Lord Jesus with their lips. And in a book sometimes, uh, in a book called Sermons and Writings, McConkie also said, the blood of Christ was shed as a great gift of wondrous grace, but... The saints are cleansed by the blood after they keep the commandments. This attitude remains flowing through the self-righteous veins of members of the Mormon church from the top to the bottom. But in many places, the Book of Mormon reflects a purely 19th century Christian position. I say in many places because there is one passage in the Book of Mormon that is in conflict with the idea of saved by grace. And we'll get to that in another day. So in comparison to what LDS leaders say today, listen to the Christian sounding passages from the Book of Mormon. 2 Nephi 31.19 talks of believers relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. Ether 4, 6, and 12 says, The Lord said, Good cometh of none, save it be of me. Moroni 6, 4 says, Relying alone upon the merits of Christ, who is the author and finisher of their faith. Straight from the Bible, by the way. Moroni 7, 24, All things which are good cometh of Christ, otherwise men were fallen. And 2 Nephi 31.19, you have not come, save it were by the words of Christ, with unshaken faith in him, relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. Again, the Book of Mormon, a fictional counterfeit to the uh, Bible, espouses the doctrines of 19th century and present day, really, Christianity. But Mormonism's modern day apostles and prophets, they do not teach these things. Why? What happened? What purpose does the book really serve if it's not followed doctrinally or in practice? Before we answer this, we have to realize that Mormonism teaches that the first principles of the gospel are faith, repentance, baptism, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands by somebody with the Mormon authority. Mormons call those the first principles and ordinances of the gospel. For Mormons, these are very basic elementary things. To Christians, they are everything. But to Mormons, they're just basic. And in fact, they're so basic, they bestow them upon their eight-year-olds. It's at eight when, they, when eight-year-old Mormon kids are supposed to have faith. They're supposed to repent. They're supposed to be baptized in water and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost by somebody in the Mormon church. Uh, after this, Mormonism places a whole bunch, a whole stack of requirements, added principles and ordinances of the gospel on the backs of their people as a means to maintain their salvation and also to establish their exaltation and to ensure that they have the right when they're dead to become a god. So they give you the first principles of the gospel when you're eight and they talk about Jesus then, and after that, they throw on a heap of life works in order for you to maintain the salvation and become exalted. The presence of these uh, additional principles and ordinances of the Mormon gospel, they often serve as a point of pride within, with the, on the Mormons. And so what happens is Latter-day Saint men and women who are really ensconced in the church, they look down on Christians as being kind of sophomoric in their faith. 
Oh, you're a, you're a Christian saved by grace through faith. How nice, little guy. We have the uh, fullness of the gospel that we carry on our backs in preparation for us to become God. You see, and when you're LDS, and I, you remember I was 40 years, in the inner sanctum and in the priesthood meetings and in the, uh, the comings and goings of, of Sunday school, these are the attitudes, and this is what the attitude is toward the Christian uh, world. But what's interesting is the Book of Mormon, in the preface of it, says it contains the fullness of the everlasting gospel. And in fact, uh, Joseph Smith in Doctrine and Covenants 4212 says that the Bible and Book of Mormon together contain the fullness of the gospel. So, if that's so, why doesn't the Book of Mormon or the Bible teach about God having a body of flesh and bone, God being an exalted man, uh, eternal marriage being requisite for exaltation, a mother in heaven, a priesthood, a Melchizedek priesthood where men on earth become high priests, Lucifer being a spirit sibling, Jesus being conceived by a fleshly father, temple endowments, temple ceilings, all of that is missing in the Book of Mormon. And, uh, so, and that's just skimming the surface. So while the LDS today truly look down their noses at saved by grace through faith Christians who praise Jesus and, and supposedly can't wait to go sit on a cloud and play a harp for eternity, that's how they describe Christians, um, listen how Joseph Smith described characters in the Book of Mormon who came to understand who Jesus was. Listen to this rhetoric that he includes in the Book of Mormon and you tell me where he got it from, okay? Second Nephi 2.22 has a character, and it says, And in that day thou shalt say, O oh Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, and thine anger is turned away, and thou hast comfortest me, behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and be not afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. And in that day ye shall say, Praise the Lord, call upon his name. Declare his doings. Does that sound like Mormonism today? Not at all. But it was certainly the way they preach from the pulpit in Joseph Smith's time because it's the way they preach from the pulpit today. Listen to Alma 1927. Oh, blessed Jesus, who has saved me from an awful hell. Oh, blessed God. You would no more hear this type of talk in a Mormon church today than, than, than you would hear a... a uh, I can't even make a comparison. I'll get in trouble. I always do. Okay. In Mosiah 4, 2 through 7, it says, And they viewed themselves in their own carnal state, saying, Oh, have mercy and apply the atoning blood of Christ, that we may receive a remission of sins. And they were filled with joy after received a remission of their sins because of their exceeding faith in Jesus Christ, that salvation might come to them that should put his trust in the Lord. This is the man that receives salvation. This is pure 19th century Christian rhetoric. And it's true rhetoric. And this is what makes the Book of Mormon so inviting to people who aren't informed about what the purpose of this book was. And finally, in Moroni 7, uh, 48, it uh, says... Pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart, that you may be filled with the love which he has bestowed upon all who are true followers of his Son, Jesus Christ, that ye may become the sons of God, that when he shall appear you may be like him, that we may be purified even as he is pure. So, again, the point is to show that Joseph started his religious fiction off on a traditional Christian bent, and the narrative of the Book of Mormon proves it. So what actually happened along the way in the historical Mormon narrative that took it from being based on a traditional Christian bent contained in the Book of Mormon to becoming this holy, non-Christian, humanist focus of world, 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 and man, man, man. Before we open the phone lines, allow me to give you a limited opinion of how I think things played out in seven uh, phases. Ready? Phase one. Joseph Smith Sr. and his son Joseph Jr. were poor and destitute, and they spent, we know this, a lot of time doing two things. Talking about Christianity and the problems with it, and trying to convince people that they had the ability to locate buried treasure using folk magic practices. That's a fact. That's phase one. Phase two. Over the course of time, the Smiths, parlayed these two focuses, 
Christianity and its faults and magic into a tale of there being buried gold plates. This morphed into a book which became added historical flair of where the Indians came from, and then it added a religious nature too. Phase three. In the end, the finished Book of Mormon was nothing more than a counterfeit to the Bible, even to the point that it used Elizabethan English, with the setting being America rather than Israel and the American Indians. And like everything else in Joseph's life and story, once the Book of Mormon was printed, he ran it up the proverbial flagpole to see if anybody would salute. All right. Phase four. The book was, in fact, saluted primarily by people who did not have a knowledge of what the Bible was really about. And as a result, Joseph merged into this role of being prophet, seer, and revelator. Phase five. With this newfound respect, Joseph Smith moved from his old stomping grounds because he had been arrested and known as a glass looker by everybody there. He moved away. And he realized that for the religion to grow, he had to somehow differentiate it from the other upstart and competing Christian churches. The Book of Mormon helped with this, but more revelations were necessary to totally place Joseph's church in a category far removed from all the Bible-based churches popping up around them. Advanced revelations and prophecies began to surface and serve this purpose. Phase six. In time, these revelations that Joseph would have superseded the generally Christian concepts of the Book of Mormon, and in time, they took precedence in the church in terms of emphasis and importance. So, phase seven. Today, the Book of Mormon, like it did at the start, continues to serve as bait in bringing unsuspecting people into the boat called Mormonism without them realizing that in time they will be gutted, filleted, and fried in a pan of totally non-biblical doctrines and practices, most of which are in conflict with their own first book of scripture. ...from an outline, and that when he made a mistake in his narrative, he would fix it, and it would be recorded in the narrative. So let's give you some examples. Mosiah 7, 8 reads, They were again brought before the king and were permitted or rather commanded, that they should answer the questions. So if it was a direct revelation from God, why would God say that they were permitted, oh, I mean, or rather permitted, they were commanded, uh, you know, why would he make that change midstream like Joseph did? Another example of this is in Alma 5.10. Listen to this. Alma says, I have never known much of the ways of the Lord and his mysteries and marvelous power. I said I had never known much of these things, but behold, I mistake. For I have seen much of his mysteries and marvelous power. So he totally changes his mind in the very thing he was saying. That wouldn't happen if it was a translation from a hard copy of gold or if it was Joseph Smith actually reading words from God and giving them to Oliver. It happened because he had an outline and he was making up the story as he went and he corrected himself right then and there. Alma 24, 19 says, And thus we see that they buried their weapons of peace or they buried their weapons of war of peace, for peace. Uh, so again, we have a correction right there in the text of this great Book of Mormon. Uh, in Alma 43:38, Joseph Smith dictated this, which Oliver Cowdery recorded. They being shielded from the more vital parts of the body, or the more vital parts of the body being shielded from the strokes of the Lamanites. So this was totally coming out of Joseph Smith's head, and it's proven by these discombobulated sentences where he's kind of doing a stream of consciousness, and he's saying, and therefore I stepped into the stream, or rather I stepped onto the bridge that was covering the stream because he was giving it to him. He was doing it, none of the other things. In 2 Nephi uh, 5.15 of the most corrected book on the face of the earth, it reads... And I did teach my people to build buildings and to work in all manner of wood and of iron and of copper and of brass and of steel and of gold and of silver and of precious ores, which were in great abundance. Then in the next verse, he says, and I, Nephi, did build a temple and I did construct it after the manner of uh, temple of Solomon, save it were not built of so many precious things, for they were not to be found upon the land. 
I mean, in the, earth, the verse right before it, he says there's gold and silver and precious ores which were in great abundance. And then the next verse he says, none of it's found upon the land to build the, 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 the temple out of. All right? The Book of Mormon says that the people of Zarahemla, they rejoiced when Mosiah said, hey, I have these brass plates and they have your genealogy on them. And, and the Book of Mormon says the people of Zarahemla rejoiced. But in the book of Omni, 117, it says that Messiah could not understand the people of Zarahemla because their language had all become corrupted. And so how could they ever understand that their genealogy was on the brass plates and rejoice over it if they couldn't understand each other? Uh, we have clumsy writing found throughout the Book of Mormon. Let me give you one example. We'll get to the others as we come across them. For example, 2 Nephi 4.14 actually reads, For a more history part are written upon mine other plates. For a more history part are written upon mine other... Huh? Uh, a more history part? Um, okay. Of course, we've pointed out the anachronistic use of Jesus in the uh, Book of Mormon, uh, but all through it, it says, and his name shall be Jesus Christ. 600 years before uh, Jesus is uh, born, it says in the Book of Mormon, his name shall be Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, 600 years before Jesus was born, Greek wasn't even in existence. The name Christ is Greek. It, it, in the Book of Mormon, it would be like it's saying, and his name shall be Jesus Messiah. Jesus didn't have a last name. His last name wasn't Christ. They act like it was Jesus Samuelson or something. It, Jesus Christ is his title. And it wouldn't have been Christ because the Greek language didn't exist 600 years before his birth. And so it would be Jesus Messiah, and that's still just a title. So another great mistake. The Book of Mormon also says that Jesus would be born at Jerusalem which is the land of our forefathers. The phrase at Jerusalem is used all through the Book of Mormon, and it's speaking of Jerusalem specifically. Where was Jesus born? He was born in Bethlehem. So important is this that in the Old Testament, Micah prophesies that the Messiah will come from Bethlehem. It's a very specific place. Is it Jerusalem? No. Is it, is it right next to Jerusalem, like Salt Lake City's right next to Murray? No, not right next to. And so it's a specific place, and it was so specific, God wanted it to be specific because that's where the Messiah would come from, yet the Book of Mormon says he would be born at Jerusalem. Uh, the Book of Mormon claims that Nephi and his family left for Jerusalem to sail to the New World in the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, uh, the king of Judah. Now listen, this is a real zinger. The Book of Mormon says in the first reigning year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, Lehi and his family left to go to the, toward the promised land. But if Nephi and his family left in the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, how would Nephi later in the Book of Mormon be able to report that Jeremiah was cast into prison? Why do we ask? Because Jeremiah being cast into prison didn't happen until the 10th year of the reign of Zedekiah. So they left in the first year of the reign of Zedekiah and they traveled through the wilderness and they built boats and they took off. And then 10 years later, after they had left, uh, scripture reports that uh, Jeremiah was thrown in, in prison. How would that be recorded in the Book of Mormon? They would have had no, no knowledge of this. They left the place. Uh, and then there's a, the Book of Mormon, Mormonians disguise problem. And this isn't that big of a deal. You can read it a lot of different ways. But there is a prophet named Abinadi in the Book of Mormon. And he ticks off a king named Noah because he's preaching repentance to the people. And, and Noah wants to kill Abinadi. So Abinadi takes off and hides for uh, two years. And then he comes back. And this is what Messiah 12.1 says. And it came to pass that after a space of two years that Abinadi came among them in disguise, that they knew him not, and began to prophesy among them, saying, Thus has the Lord commanded me, saying, Abinadi, go and prophesy unto this people. So this is what it's saying. The guy, was they wanted to kill him. He put on a disguise. He went back, and when he preached to him, he said, The Lord told me to come before you and say, Abinadi. What's that? What's the disguise for? Then there is a point we have already mentioned and that the Book of Mormon 
is that it's, uh, they were Jews, and they were supposed to keep the law of Moses. Second Nephi 5.10 says, And we did observe to keep the judgments and statutes and the commandments of the Lord in all things according to the law of Moses. Nowhere in Joseph Smith's Book of Mormonian does it anywhere mention Passover feasts, observance or celebrations, sabbatical feasts, jubilees, purification rituals, other feasts, or circumcision. It's nowhere in this Jewish text. And yet that one passage says we did keep it all. Now listen carefully. Some Mormons try to defend and say that Messiah 2.4 clearly shows that the, they did observe the law of Moses. This is what it says in Messiah. It says in the Book of Mormon, they also took the firstlings of their flock that they might offer sacrifices and burnt offerings according to the law of Moses. That singular passage is what Mormons used to say, see, they did. But here's the problem. Under the law of Moses, the firstling of every flock was considered as already belonging to God and therefore could only be used as a peace offering, never a burnt offering. And so what Joseph, not knowing these intricacies, he just threw in and when they used him as a burnt, a Jew would never do that because the law would not permit it. So we can see that these errors are huge. A Jew would never do it. Um, Major faux pas, Senor Smith, major for Jewish people. Another embarrassing mistake in the Book of Mormon was the Nephite people were supposedly so impressed with Nephi the, Nephi the king, they made a decree that all kings thereafter would be called Nephi. Jacob 1.1 tells us about it. Wherefore the people were desirous to retain in remembrance his name. And whoso should reign in his steed were called by the people second Nephi, third Nephi, and so forth, according to the reigns of the kings, and thus they were called by the people. But the very next king was named Messiah. And no kings thereafter in the Book of Mormon are ever named Nephi. Um, and then we have the brother of Jared mistake. We're getting to it. Uh, Ether 3.15 uh, God says to the brother of Jared, and remember Joseph Smith is writing a, 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 a parallel to the Bible, never have I showed myself unto man whom I've created. That's a quote. Yet in the Doctrine and Covenants, 107.54, Joseph Smith the, says the Lord appeared to uh, Adam, showed himself to Adam. So we have a complete contradiction there. And we also have Joseph Smith saying he, uh, uh, the Lord appeared to him. Uh, Joseph made another boo-boo on that one. Uh, and then we have the word adieu. That is a French word. Adieu makes itself into the text of the Book of Mormon. Uh, now, Mormon defenders say, well, as a translator, Joseph had the liberty to use whatever word would fit what he was translating. And I would agree. If he was translating from a set of gold plates and was just looking at them and he knew how to do it and he saw a word that was tough and mm, I think I'm going to have to use French here to say goodbye, adieu, and put it in, that would make sense. But if he's reading off, off writing coming from God in a hat, that's telling him what to say, and Oliver's recording it, it means God chose to use adieu. God is telling him to use the word adieu. I, I tell you, uh, I suppose it's possible. <laughs> it, it, maybe God was a beret. Uh, I mean, where does it end? And, and so finally, let's look at the biggest farce in the world in terms of mistakes in the Book of Mormonian. And that it, it makes you wonder how anybody, how any woman running for president of the United States and is going to govern our country could believe this stuff. Uh, what am I talking about? The Jaredite barges. In the Book of Ether and the Book of Mormon, uh, it claims that God confounded the language at the Tower of Babel. By the way, I looked it up. It's Babel. Babel. And at that time, there at the Tower of Babel, God told Jared and his brother, flee and go. And so they did. And the brother of Jared, Joseph later tells us his name was Mahan Rai Mori Ankimer. Uh, anyway, God told Mahan Rai Mori Ankimer to build eight barges. And this is how the Book of Mormonian describes these barges, which are going to cross over the Pacific Ocean 
from the Tower of Babel's area and land in the Americas, it says. And they were small, and they were light upon the water, even unto the likeness of a fowl upon the water. They were exceedingly tight, even that they would hold water like unto a dish. And the ends were peaked, and the length was the length of a tree. So what we have is a tree-length, football-shaped thing. That's really about, and I've seen pictures drawn by Mormon people who say it was all like a football-shaped thing. It was covered in animal skins. The Mahan Rai Mori Ankimer made eight of them. All right? Now, you got that glorious uh, description? The Book of Mormon says a furious wind, in Ether 6.5, then blew. And for 344 days it blew, and these barges landed in the Americas. If that wind pushed those barges just three knots, that would mean the, about the speed you could walk. They would get to the Americas far sooner, and in fact, they would circle the globe with a furious wind pushing that strong. Uh, uh, and they were light, and they were floating upon the water. But what makes the story even more ridiculous is that these barges acted like submarines. Animal skinned, they would go beneath the ocean during storms, still cruising along. And then it gets better. The Lord forgot to light the inside of them, and he forgot to make a way for the people inside of them to breathe. This led Mahanrai Mori Ankimer to go before the Lord and say, Oh Lord, there's no light in them. In them we cannot breathe. Yes! And so the Lord touches rocks that glow. Remember, Joseph's looking in a hat. The Lord touches rocks that glow, and then he tells them, he changes the code on how to build a skin barge, and he says, put a hole in the top. And then he also says, and I'll allow you to put a hole in the bottom. So these footballs have a hole in the top, they have a hole in the bottom. They're cruising through the Pacific Ocean with people and animals inside. <laughs> Mahan Rai Mori Ankimer, tall as a tree, Let's open up the phone lines, 801-9. I was reading a book, uh, Sidney Rigdon, Portrait of Religious Success, where there was a reference made to that, jo that Joseph Smith, after writing the Book of Mormon, took it to Canada to sell the copyright. Yeah. Is that true is my first question. Second okay, stop, question stop, is, stop, stop, stop. I can't remember the question. So the first one is Joseph himself didn't go. He received a revelation from God sending others to go and told them that they would find financing in Canada for the book. And... It was a false. It was a false prophecy, which makes him a false okay. prophet. Second question. Okay. okay, got that. My second question is, is: Well, then, by selling that copyright, obviously there was going to be some kind of benefit financially. Who stood to gain from the sale of the copyright? Who who owned the copyright? Joseph Smith. Yeah. Mrs. Joseph Smith. Um, Joseph Smith owned the copyright. He was the author and proprietor in the first edition, stamped on the front, title page. And had they sold that. And he was willing to sell the word of God, by the way, the copyright to get money. Uh, we're going to cover that later. Uh, he would have benefited monetarily and probably paid back some of the money that was loaned to him. Okay. Well, then my last question is, 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 is it true that the first edition of the Book of Mormon says that it was written or authored by Joseph Smith, whereas the consecutive editions all state that it was translated by Joseph Smith? That's absolutely true going to con uh, look at some of the kind of laughable, sophomoric attempts Joseph Smith made in his Book of Mormon to outdo the Bible. You see, Joseph's Book of Mormon outdoes the Bible in many areas. And a man named M.T. Lamb in a book called The Golden Bible, which I highly recommend, available at utlm.org, uh, in his book he points out that uh, Joseph made the Book of Mormon more impressive than the Bible in order to outdo the Bible in many ways. He would take biblical topics and themes and inject them with literary steroids to make his version far more marvelous and miraculous than the Lord's Bible. Says Lamb, quote, almost every page is filled with strange visions, with astounding miracles, with Bible incidents worked over and embellished and enlarged 
with accounts of remarkable conversions, with revelations imitating those of the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos, with men almost eclipsing the Lord Jesus Christ in their marvelous powers. Smith accomplished this in a number of ways, some of them amusing. Let's see if we can name some of them tonight before we go to the phones. First of all, the people of the Book of Mormon organized Christian churches where baptism by immersion was occurring. They had the blessings of New Testament spiritual gifts, including speaking in tongues, prophesying, performing miracles. None of that may be a big deal to you, except all of that was present in the Book of Mormon teachings a hundred years before Jesus was born. He outdid the Christian church by having the Christian church exist a hundred years before Christ was born. That's one way that he outdid the Bible. Then, after Jesus ascends to the Father in the New Testament, he actually makes a visit over in the Americas where he stays for 40 days, he preaches, did miracles, and then he ordains 12 apostles here in the Americas. So the Book of Mormon has 12 of his own apostles that are made here to, to compete and compare with the Bible. So he, he ordained 12 apostles in Palestine, and then he ordained 12 here in America, gives us a total of 24. In time, the whole Book of Mormon land is converted after Jesus comes here, and for 200 years, the whole land is in peace. It's like a millennial reign here. For 200 years, they're all in complete peace. All the wars and everything is gone because... Uh, and, but you have to say, well, is that that big of a deal? It is, because what happened when the Lord ascended into heaven in Palestine? Everything became undone. There became wars and there became all kinds of things. So you got to compare and contrast what is happening. Of course, as we pointed out, Smith uh, outdid the Bible in verbosity. Uh, and it wasn't just verbosity. It was horrible verbosity. One of the sure signs of inspired scripture is uh, aphoristic uh, gems of inspiration in holy writ. It is clean, it is clear, and even though if it's in King's English and some of the uh, uh, translations are difficult, the thoughts are very clear. Uh, for example, in the Bible, Matthew describes Jesus blessing the little children in three verses. Joseph takes a full page to cover the same thing that Jesus does supposedly here in the Americas. Paul's conversion story, perhaps the most important conversion story uh, or uh, uh, in the Bible, if there's not one that's more important than another, uh, is recorded in 18 verses in the Bible. Uh, in the Book of Mormon, Joseph uses two full pages to cover uh, Alma's uh, conversion and six pages to cover the conversion of a guy named King Lamoni. It's just fluff. It's non-inspired uh, amateur fluff. In 20 verses, Paul presents amazing insights on uh, the vineyard and the olive tree, uh, but Joseph Smith takes eight full pages to supply us with this incomprehensible babbling called the parable of the olive tree. If anyone can understand that thing, I mean, you deserve a PhD. Uh, in example after example, Joseph, unable to deliver brief aphoristic gems of truth, uh, by the Holy Spirit, he would overcompensate by outdoing the Bible's quality with the Book of Mormon's quantity. So let me give you an example. This is a single sentence in the Book of Mormon. It's a single sentence. You ready? Here we go. Try to hang with me. And behold, this is the thing which I give unto you for a sign, for verily I say unto you, that when these things which I declare unto you, and which I shall declare unto you hereafter of myself, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, which shall be given unto you of the Father, shall be made known unto the Gentiles, that they may know concerning this people, who are a remnant of the house of Jacob, and concerning this my people, who shall be scattered by them, verily, verily, I say unto you, when these things shall be made known unto them of the Father, and shall come forth of the Father from them unto you, for it is wisdom of the Father that they should be established in this land and be set up as a free people by the power of the Father, that these things might come forth from unto them from a remnant of your seed, that the covenant of the Father may be fulfilled, which he has covenanted with his people, O house of Israel. Wherefore, when these works and the works which shall be wrought 
Among you hereafter shall come forth from the Gentiles unto your seed, which shall dwindle in unbelief because of iniquity. For thus it behooveth the Father that it should come forth from the Gentiles, that he may show forth his power unto the Gentiles. For this cause, that the Gentiles, if they would not harden their hearts, that they may repent and come unto me, and be baptized in my name, and know of the true points of my doctrine, that they may be numbered among my people, O house of Israel. And when these things come to pass, that thy seed shall begin to know these things, it shall be a sign unto them, that they may know that the work of the Father hath already commenced unto the fulfilling of the covenant, which has been made unto the people who are the house of of Israel, period. Architect, <laughs> you've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. And they call that inspired? It's, it's just unbelievable when your eyes open to the truth that this type of stuff's there. Okay, from the New Testament part of the Book of Mormon, listen to how Joseph's Book of Mormon has Jesus speak when he comes to the Americas. Now, before reading this really quickly, let me remind you, there is a restorationist movement afoot, and restorationists who were alive at the time of Joseph Smith believed that the true church had to be in the name of Christ. That was uh, set up by Alexander Campbell well before Joseph Smith was even born. And so this was a theory and a thought that was out there. The true church has to be in the name of Christ. So Joseph, of course, covers it in his Book of Mormon. This is what he has Jesus say. Listen. And Jesus again showed himself unto them, for they were praying unto the Father in his name. And Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said unto them, What will ye that I should give unto you? And they said unto him, We will that thou wouldest tell us the name whereby we shall call this church. For there are disputations among the people concerning this matter. The Lord said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Why is it the people should murmur and dispute because of this thing? Have they not read the scriptures, which say you must take upon you the name of Christ, which is my name? Okay, first of all, his name was not Christ. I doubt he ever called himself Christ, Christos maybe in the Greek, Messiah, but it wasn't his last name. That was a title. His name was Yeshua, Joshua. His name is Jesus. And yet here he says that you should name of Christ, which is my name. Unbelievable. And it goes on. For by this name you shall be called at the last day, and whosoever taketh upon him my name and endureth to the end, the same shall be saved at the last day. Wherefore, whatsoever ye shall do, you should do it in my name. Therefore, ye shall call the church in my name, and ye shall call upon the Father in my name, and he will bless the church for my sake. And how be it in my church, save it be called in my name. And then we find out that Joseph did not call his church in his name until after four or five tries. So we have all of this culminating forward. Let me uh, continue on quickly. There are Book of Mormon miracles, says M.T. Lamb, quote, The Bible bears no comparison to the Book of Mormon, either in the number of its miracles or in their strange, unnatural, super miraculous character. Um, we've already told you about the animal skin submarines that Joseph concocted that were lighted by rocks inside. Uh, also in the Book of Mormon, God makes meat uh, from animals sweet so that the Nephites, when they kill animals while they're traveling, don't have to cook it. Why does God do this according to the Book of Mormon? Because he'll help them out that they don't have to build fires. That's really his reasoning. We've already talked about the miracles of the Liahona and how that worked, that brass ball that would uh, give miracles, uh, would give messages on the outside, and then also had spindles that would point, and it was found outside of the tent. And all it was was just another uh, super miraculous idea Joseph had of having a rock and a hat. The Liahona was a religious icon that he included in the Book of Mormon. And, you know, the children of Israel, the way that they told things were two rocks, they, and, and, and they would cast lots for them, and they, those rocks would... Would, would tell them what to do. Then there's 2,000 stripling warriors who, because their mothers taught them not to doubt, uh, was delivered by God. In fact, they were fighting ferocious, mohawked, skilled Lamanite Indians, and these 2,000 stripling warriors, none of them ever even fell to the earth. They were so protected by God. So Joseph Smith's 2,000 uh, stripling warriors outdo any Bible army, any time. And then another Book of Mormon character, Samuel the Lamanite, nobody could hit him with arrows or rocks thrown at him. He could stand there all day and you could be right, right next to him and throw, no, nope, no, nope, couldn't hit him. 
uh, another, I mean, more powerful than the Batman. Okay, and then when Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem, the Bible tells us that while he was on the cross, darkness covered the land for three hours. Book of Mormon, darkness covers the land three days, three whole days. When Jesus was on the cross in Jerusalem, there were earthquakes, there were rumblings, there was darkness for three hours, and when he died, guess what? Boom. It all stopped. Why? Because the Lord propitiated the earth, the world, to the Father. He paid for the sins of the world, and it was done. And that is just, that's part of Scripture that, that shows you the truthfulness of it, all of the stuff in it. But in the Book of Mormon, we have another scene. In Joseph's Book of Mormon, first after he dies... There were tempests and earthquakes swallowing up 16 major cities. Then immediately there were these mists of darkness that were so dark you couldn't light a match. They didn't have matches, but you couldn't rub two sticks. You couldn't light a fire. They were so vapors, were so heavy that even fire couldn't burn in them, okay? And then Jesus pops up in the middle of it after three days. And you know what Jesus says to them? Whoa, whoa, whoa unto the people. Oh, and the people say in terror, you know, and this is totally contrary to what the Bible message is. The people say, oh, that we had repented before this great and terrible day. Then would our mothers and our fair daughters and our children that uh, would have been spared and not buried up in that great city, Moron Iha. Okay, now you got to think about this. There were terrible earthquakes. There were mists of darkness. Nobody could see a thing. Everything's getting destroyed, three days of it, and when Jesus comes, everybody somehow knows that the fair daughters and mothers were buried in Moroni Ha. They somehow are aware of that, and they, they complain, oh, that we had repented because everybody's dead over in Moroni Ha. They, they wouldn't have any ability to do it. They couldn't even see their, their hand in front of their face. How could they know? It's stuff like that that proves the thing is a con. And yet people read through it and don't see it. A couple other things before we go to the phones. 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820. First time callers, LDS callers, please. And please turn your television sets down once the operators clear your calls. Joseph beats the Bible in a number of other ways. Noah built one ark. Jared in the Book of Mormon built eight animal barges to travel under the sea with glowing rocks. We've mentioned that several times because it is so ludicrous. Moses saw the back parts of the Lord. Uh, the brother of Jared spoke with him face to face. Moses was up on Sinai before coming down with his face aglow. Forty days it took, and he came down with his face aglow. But uh, Joseph's Book of Mormon character, Abinadi, just preaching a sermon, it says, and his face shone with exceeding luster, even as Moses did. The Book of Mormon character, Abinadi, saw writing on the wall that was far more intricate than Daniel's. Alma's death was made far more mysterious than Moses. And Daniel in the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who walked through fire, was nothing compared to the 12 apostles uh, Jesus called in the Americas, who, quote, thrice were cast into a furnace and received no harm, thrice were cast into a den of wild beasts, and behold, they did play with the beast as a child plays with a suckling lamb. And when Jesus was born, Jerusalem uh, God put a star in the sky, but when Jesus was born in the Americas, in the Book of Mormon, there was no night for uh, the, the. There was no night at all. It was light the entire time. They couldn't tell the difference between noonday and midnight. It was so bright. Always out doing the Bible because he had to give something that would trump it. What is the problem with this? That what is the biggest thing that Joseph Smith did? He took the words of Jesus that Jesus spoke when he was alive incarnate on this earth, and he had a man named Nephi speak them hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. Here's the danger in that before we go to the phones. Suppose someone has never read the Bible, and the missionaries give them a Book of Mormon, and they read the Book of Mormon, and they read these words of Jesus that are coming out of this Nephi prophet's mouth, 300 years before Jesus is born, and then they pick up the Bible and they could do a, I've oh, been there, done that. You know, Book of Mormon is true. The Bible, this is kind of boring. That happens when people read certain types of literature. On the other hand, let's say that they have read the Bible. They could say, this is really familiar to the Bible. Wow, this is the same verbiage. And of course, the missionaries say, well, it's the same author. And so, and, and so that convinces them. 
any type of counterfeit to God's truth is a diabolical counterfeit because what it does is it leads people into things that are not true. This is what lies at the heart of the Book of uh, Mormon, deception that dilutes the power of God, the Word of God, and God. But let's just say they're not. Let's just say the Book of Mormon is a good Christian book like you're saying it is here to the audience, okay? The problem is, is it's an introductory drug. And the missionaries use the Book of Mormon because Joseph Smith was raised in a Christian environment. He went to Christian revivals. He knew the Bible. And he wrote a book that was patterned right after it, okay? And so Joseph Smith has this model in his head, and he decides that he's going to present this new book, and he writes it over a course of a seven-year period, six-year period of time. So, okay, let's say it's innocuous, okay? But then when people read that book and they say, well, it's innocuous, I'll join the Mormon church because that's what the missionaries use. They don't use the Doctrine and Covenants. They don't use the Pearl of Great Price, and they don't use the temple rituals or any of the legalisms, they use the Book of Mormon. Introductory drug, first toke. Pretty soon you join the church. And now you start to find out, well, I gotta start to do this. I better do that. And you know, you gotta get you ready to receive the priesthood now. And we gotta get you ready to re receive all these other things. And pretty soon you're starting to snort a little bit of, of crack. And pretty soon you're mainstreaming meth. And pretty soon you're shooting heroin in your eyeballs. And you are trapped into a religion that is the biggest con on earth. This is the problem with the Book of Mormon, Jen, is that it is an introductory drug to a church that hey, traps okay, I people. Know. Uh, so according to what you're saying, all these Mormons are shooting heroin? Yes. They are shooting theological heroin. And it keeps them addicted to the idea that they have to earn their salvation. That is no, a drug no, no, more powerful. No, they don't have to earn their salvation. I, I think there's just a little bit of misunderstanding. Oh, that. really? I was a Mormon 40 years, and I'm misunderstanding. 40 years I'm in it. I'm a high priest. No, I'm, I'm a sorry. seminary teacher. I'm in a bishopric. I'm in a state guy council. 40 years I'm in it. I serve it with my family. I go to the temple, and I misunderstand it. You're wrong. I'm sorry for the emphasis, but you're wrong. The thing is a, it is a lie. It traps people and does not give them the liberty in Christ. But ripping on Joel Osteen, I know he's a great public speaker, but at least he loves the Savior and wants people to become like him. And at least instead of spending his entire ministry getting up and ripping on the LDS church or the Catholic Church or whatever church it is that you spend your days ripping on. An hour a week. You do not emulate what, to me, is a Christ-like true Christian. And I, I know some really great Christians. Oh, I, I bet you do. not spend their time. Okay, with, Mary, you made the point. Let me tell you something. I don't give a rat's rear end what you think. Okay? This is what I care about. Truth. I care about truth. And wait, Jesus, wait, 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 I let you talk, uh, wait, I let you, t I let you talk, Mary, 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 I knew it was going to do any good. Mary, I let you talk. You're an evil person, and I feel sorry for Mary, Margaret, and all your children. Mary, why are you ripping on me? Why are you screaming at me? Let me talk. Well, you started screaming when I was dead. No, I let you finish. Let me talk. Mary, let, Mary, you, you made some propositions here. Let me speak. I don't care what your opinion is of what Christianity is or isn't. We have facts. When someone d dilutes the facts or changes them, I am going to stand up and say, why are you interrupting me? Why are you interrupting me? Trying to be like Christ. But ripping on the prophet of the Mormon church and the person running for the president of the United States, they so what? Is evil. You're an evil person. What are you talking about? Let me. If Jesus was here, he would rip on Monson too, and he would no, say, he "Don't vote for a Mormon." And he loved them. And he you know what? You're just deluded. You, no matter you what care. He did. What are you? He's a really good person, and you've become evil. He's a really good and person, and, and I am not a person for speaking truth. You have truth. about you and all your black clothing. All my black. Ma Mary, did you hang up now? No, okay. I didn't. I'm still okay, here. Okay, just let me speak here, just for a second, without you interrupting. What is truth, Mary? Truth is trying to become like the Savior and live on a your, life like He did. On your own, wait, Mary. Okay, I just want a simple on your own terms. On your own terms, it's becoming like Him, and we try to realize. How do you become? Wait, wait, wait. Okay. How do you? Know how, who He is and pray to Him. 
How do you become okay. like him, Mary? How do you become like him? Explain that to me. How do you become like him? Yeah. You pray to him and you develop a personal relationship with him. Okay, but please that stop. Doesn't mean i got to stop you. Are you LDS? Are, are you, you as a person become have a relationship with the Savior. How does that happen? And then you share that with others by okay. teaching them love and okay. Christ-like. You don't Okay, stop, you don't stop, have okay. You okay. have an evil spirit about okay. you. Okay, I have the evil spirit. And I put this to the channel. Oh, please, spirit please, King, Mary, and please. And I can see it. Can I follow? You can see it? Okay. Mary, are you LDS? Yes, I am. Okay, you know very well you don't pray to Christ, so why are you saying that here? Because you pray in the name of Christ, and you name, know that, you John, and you know. Okay, I know, I know. That's why I'm calling you out on it. You don't pray to Christ. Well, Christians do. Yes. Christians do. Mormons you do not. You know that I know. And spend Mary, your time ripping on the obvious Mary, church. okay, you made your point. Isn't about being Mary, Christian. And I know a real, uh, really, really, I know, really I know. Mary, Christian let's leader. talk about Both facts, Mary. Mary, Mary you know Christians and Baptists. And, Mary, let's talk about facts, okay? You say that you... You become a you get in a relationship with Jesus Christ. How does that happen, Mary? How does it happen through reading your scriptures and daily prayer? That's how you establish a relationship with Christ. Mary, have you been born again? Yes, I have. How did that happen? How does happen being born again, accepting the Savior into your life, and who's and the, and and who's like the Savior? I'm sorry. And who is the Savior? You're Mormon. Tell us who the Savior is. Who is the Savior? Yeah, who is he? He's Jesus Christ who died for us. You know that. He, don't, don't add, I know that, okay? Because you, we're having a dialogue here. Let's just, let's just tone it down. So you say, he's, is he God? He is God, yes. He is God, okay. Do you worship him? Yes, I do. Was he created? Yes, he was. He, by whom? Who was, he no. who was he created by, Mary? Yes, he was created by our Heavenly Father. Okay, with who? I'm sorry? Where did his spirit come from, Mary? It's always existed. Okay, but where did it come from? Because he's our brother, right? So where did I... Jesus' spirit come from, Mary? It has always existed. No, that, it's, it's always existed in what way? Matter that, matter that has always existed. Matter has always existed according to Joseph Smith. Was Jesus a created being in his person like Lucifer and like you? His spirit? Yeah, his spirit that came down and took on this body. Was that formed and created by the Father? The spirit, was the spirit already existed. I know the spirit matter existed, but was the spirit matter formed into the spirit of Christ being a great and noble one prior, quoting the book of Abraham, like yours was and mine was and Abraham, and every inhabitant of the earth was Jesus created it by, in his spirit by the Father in the preexistence. He was created just like us. He's okay, thank you. Now, let me ask you something. If he was created, how did he create all things? He created them with... Through the heaven, through Heavenly Father. But wait, Scripture says in John one, He, Jesus, created all things, all. Okay, and the Greek is emphatic that it's all things. How did Jesus create all things? And the reason I point this out, Mary, is because you say, wait, you say, I want to have a relationship. You get that by reading the scripture, which includes Bible, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pro the Great Price, and you pray to him, but I want to know who you're praying to, you see, because the Christians, Mary, believe Jesus is God, uncreated, no beginning, alpha and omega, no end, and he created all things. Do you believe that as a Latter-day Saint? Yeah, true. True Christians do believe in the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. I'm not saying there wasn't a Father and Son and Holy Ghost. I want to know about Christ to you, Mary. You are, if, you, if you're speaking truthfully, as a Latter-day Saint, Jesus was created in his spirit just like you and I were. He is our elder brother spiritually. He offered to come down for us. This is so contrary to how Bible-believing Christians believe, Mary. Exactly. It is contrary to how It is believe. contrary. And so now, on that premise... See, it doesn't no. say that I'm not Christian because it's contrary to how they believe because we, we differ on some things. Some it things? take away that an LDS person is Christian. Okay, Mary, Mary, let's just talk about God, though. His Father, our Father in Heaven. Where did He come from, Mary? He has always existed. Where did He come from? Was He ever a man, Mary? 
Okay, you're getting way too deep into this. No, I'm just asking you. Was, was he a man, Mary? He, he may have existed as a man. Okay, so now we have <laughs> no, another fundamental difference. No, 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 no. We have another fundamental difference. The God we worship is not a man. He's never been a man. He does not have a penis. He does not copulate with Mary into creating Jesus in a body of flesh. So you call here and you spin this screaming yarn, which I'm returning to you now, and you act like, oh, we're so Christian and you're so not, and you have an evil spirit and, and we're the same. And then when we just ask about five questions, you fail on every one of them. Every single one of them you fail based on what the Bible says. And you call here and you get on my case and you say, I have an evil spirit. You are deceived. This is the reason we do it, Mary. Because everything you believe, everything, is a falsehood relative to biblical Christianity. I feel sorry for you. I don't care what you feel about me. It's irrelevant what you feel. What are the facts, Mary? What are the facts? Research your prophet Joseph Smith's life. Research the doctrines you say you believe in. Go to your temple and swear oaths. You'd like to make a call. You gotta understand, when they're screaming, I scream back, it is part of the entertainment. I could sit with Mary right now, have a Diet Coke, eat fries, and talk normally. But when we're in this debate, they call because they have a voice, and they think they can show everybody listening how smart they are and how good Mormonism is, and it's a lie. It's part of the fraud. So you gotta hit them right where they're, right where they're at so that you can show them you are not telling the truth. I wish Joel Osteen, what, did you notice that she brought up my criticism of Joel Osteen? You know, but before I bowed, she never even mentioned Joel Osteen, but he sided with the Mormons. I wish Joel Osteen would say, Mitt Romney says he believes in Jesus is the Son of God. Why doesn't Joel Osteen say, Mitt, who is, the, who is Jesus? Why doesn't he say, who is God? Why doesn't he say, what do you think of the... ...thing that the LPS Church does not want you to know. This video was made to expose a small number of truths that are hidden by the LDS Church. I hope that the viewer of this video has at least a cursory understanding of this church and its teachings. For the sake of time, I will only go over a few of the lies in this great sea of mist and disinformation. First, the Mormon Church will never tell you much about the actual life Joseph Smith led. Joseph Smith was a con man. Court records were found about 10 years ago stating that Joseph Smith was a glass looker, i.e. someone who looked into an object in order to see the future for spirits. This was illegal and Smith used this transparently false activity in order to steal money. But it doesn't stop there. Mr. Smith also started a Ponzi scheme called the Kirtland Safety Society. This so-called bank was founded without a charter and used its own currency. This bank bankrupted its members and Smith was eventually found guilty once again of fraud. You hear a lot about the first vision in the Mormon church, but they don't tell you a lot of the facts. Smith changed his story on the first vision multiple times. Not to mention that the first version of the vision was published almost 20 years after the reported date. You won't hear about how Smith was finally kicked out of New York for his law breaking. You won't even hear that it was for those same reasons the Mormons were run out of Missouri. It is seen today as some Holocaust-like persecution. The truth is that Smith and his followers were trying to set up a theocracy. Smith more or less named himself king of the new territory. The Mormons were breaking the laws of marriage with polygamy, etc., etc. That's another thing. They usually only talk about Joseph and Emma. They don't seem to focus much on his 40 or so other wives. Keep in mind that many of these women were married to other men, but Smith claimed not only that God wanted them to sleep with him, but that they should not tell their other husbands. Also, they would never admit the fact that many of the wives were underage which furthered the crimes of Smith and his followers. You won't hear about the Nahuu Expositor. The newspaper which dared to utilize free speech and denounce the Mormon Church. You won't hear that Smith ordered the destruction of this newspaper in its building and that it was subsequently burned. You won't even hear that this was the real reason he was put into jail. 
they wouldn't dare to tell me that this reason and the above facts are the real reasons that Mormons were run out of Missouri. No, the Mormon church would tell you that they were run out because of religious persecution. Once in Utah, you won't hear that the government would not grant statehood to this territory unless the Mormon religion denounced polygamy. You won't hear that is the real reason that polygamy was left by the LDS church. You won't hear that blacks were not able to hold any priesthood position in the church until 1978. You won't hear about the heavy hand the LDS church lays on politics. And they definitely won't tell you that one of their most sacred beliefs is nothing more than the tool of a cult. Ceilings are done in the temple to seal family members to each other for time and all eternity. The problem is that if a family member decides that the Mormon church isn't their cup of tea and that they wish to leave, these seals are broken and they are cut off from their family. It is a disgusting, vulgar attempt to use the love of your family against you. No other religion in the world utilizes these evil cult-like tactics in order to block exit from this deceitful church. How do I know all this? I used to be LDS. I googled reliable sources for information. I opened my eyes. The facts are out there. Let's talk about how it began. Witchcraft in the church. Unmasking paganism is to un uncover the veil and expose the pagan practices that are happening in the church. This is an end time message, I believe, for the church. And this is also a crash course on paganism and its dangers. You see, we don't want to be deceived by the enemy's devices. It's because some things can look good, sound good, but not necessarily mean they're good. I'm also a son of a preacher. In the 1980s, my father had a ministry called Miracle Temple in Dallas, Texas. I witnessed many deliverances and healings. And as a preacher's kid, I was the one that carried this big old, you know, family Bible that would run around and tell everybody, hey, if you don't get saved, you're going to hell, you know, the big old Bibles and everything. But everything was going fine until witchcraft entered into the pews. I believe a family of witches, we call Jezebels, were sent to destroy the ministry. Great division began occurring when they began to come. They, I believe they cast a spell on my father. They planted a pouch in the church, and they planted a pouch inside our home. It was involved with a grandmother, a, a mother, and a daughter. And understand, they were the biggest financial supporters of the ministry. They became close to the leaders. You understand that they're going to get real close to the leaders. The congregation members wanted them out, but my father would not listen to them. Well, mainly because of they were bringing the finances into the church. But the ministry was destroyed. The Jezebel spirit destroyed the work of the Lord. The Miracle Temple no longer exists today. Actually, it's been torn to the ground. I went just recently to go see about where it's at. It's not there no more. 1815 Canada Drive in Dallas, Texas is not there no more. See, by allowing Jezebel into the church, it brings devastation. It will destroy a church. Let's look at Psalm 74, 3. Lift up thy feet into the perpetual desolations, even to all that the enemy have done wickedly in the sanctuary. Thine enemies roar in the midst of thy congregations. They set up signs for, in signs for signs. Psalm 74, 7. They have cast fire into thy sanctuary. They have defiled by casting down the dwelling place of thy name to the ground. Does it sound like witchcraft came into that sanctuary? It sure did. Revelation 2.20, thou sufferest that woman Jezebel would cause herself a prophetess to, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrifice unto idols. And it said, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. This is Jezebel in the church. The, what does the Jezebel spirit does? It seduces. It gains authority in the church. It also brings in flatteries. It rebels against male authority. It uses beauty and seduction and will lure you to ruin. And also, it's not necessarily a woman. It could also be a man. Let's look at the, some of the spirits. It gains power by destroying others. It uses sex to control their man. Never wrong. Let's look at this one. They're warlike in their personality or deceptively sweet. In other words, they could be mean. At the same time, they can be sweet. They seduce the shepherds or those in leadership, and they bring in paganism. You got to understand that Elijah stood up for righteousness. That's what we need some people to stand up for righteousness today. The children of Israel rebelled and they began worshiping Baal. The prophet Elijah stood up for truth. See, the church has rebelled. We need to stand up today and get paganism out of the church. 
Revelation 2.22, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. This we call spiritual idolatry. In other words, we're committing fornication with all these different paganism that's coming to the church. See, we've got to understand that paganism cannot stay in the church. These are the last days. It's not necessarily rituals and practices, but seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Let's talk about the uh, witchcraft, witchcraft unnoticed in the church. This is my second encounter on Sunday, July 8, 2001. I was invited to one of the largest mega churches in Dallas, Texas. I was invited to speak to the children about the dangers of magic and the occult. I, during my PowerPoint presentation, the Holy Spirit convicted the children. An example, at the altar, they began bringing their Harry Potter books and their card games, their Pokemon, and their Neopets. And they began bringing them to the altar or probably picked up hundreds of dollars worth of material. They said, we want nothing to do. If this has to do with the devil, we want nothing to do with it. But the church did not receive the warning message. I got a phone call and got complaints from the children's parents. They saw nothing wrong with books like Harry Potter, and I was bringing scare tactics. They said those toys were not cheap, and it keeps them entertained. And this, this gave me another encounter that the church doesn't realize that paganism is in the church. This was my second encounter, and I found my answers. Understand, spiritual blindness is in the church. There's blind guides leading the blind. What does the Bible say? Matthew 15, 14, let them alone, be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Luke 6, 39, can the blind lead the blind, shall they not both fall into the ditch? In other words, the blind are leading the blind today. Isaiah 56, 10, it says, his watchmen are blind, they are ignorant, they are dumb dogs, they cannot bark, sleep, and lying down, loving to slumber. He goes on to say, and they are shepherds that cannot understand. They look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. In other words, they're in it for the money. There's a lot of shepherds out there that are hirelings. They do it for the money. But God is calling true watchmen to give them warning from me. It says, I set you up as a watchman. And I believe that I'm watchman to the church to realize that paganism is in the church and we have to get it out. See, today the tr truth is blurred. We need truth more than ever before. People will accept anything because they're blinded by Satan's lies. Truth will bring deliverance and set the captives free. What does it say? It also, we're trying to find the straight and narrow road. In other words, we've lost our way. We lost, we're off course. The church is, 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 is lost. And we're trying to get back on the straight and narrow road. John 8, 31, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's not going to set you free. It will make you free. When we're free, we're free indeed. Matthew 7, 13, enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. I don't know about you, but I'm looking for the straight and narrow way. Do you understand that the true church will prevail? Matthew 6, 18, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Understand the truth will prevail. So why is this message so important? Why is it important to stand up for the truth? What is the objective? To warn the church to beware of things that look and sound good, but are dangerous. In other words, they're poisonous. It just takes a little bit of sprinkle of poison to really uh, mess up the lump. Ephesians 5.11, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, expose, re rebuke, reprove. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. That's what there is a lot of secrecy going on in the church. And the job is for the watchman to come and expose the darkness. Revelation 18, 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and ye receive not of her plagues. In other words, we got to come out of Babylon. Uh, this is a, a, a confused nation. We're confused about what God we worship, what God we believe in. 
I'm what you call an apologist. I, I'm apologetic ministry. I'm always ready to give an answer to everyone that asks a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. See, understand, as the church, we got to be ready with answers. we got to be ready when someone comes and asks us, why are we a Christian? Are we just a Christian in name? Are we truly living for the Lord? Today, we got to fight the good fight of faith. It says, contend for the faith. The word contends mean to, to fight, to, to continue to uh, persevere, to continue to keep fighting the good fight of faith. I believe a lot of people in the church have given up. But this is the time to give up. This is the time to get in the fight. Amen. We got a submergent church. This church is not emergent. It's submergent. The church is headed toward disaster, just like the Titanic. Remember, Titanic said, this is a ship that cannot be sunk. But they didn't heed the warning when they began to see the iceberg. And when they hit that iceberg, the ship began to sink. And the ship is beginning to sink, and we don't realize it. So you, we need to heed the warning today. Now let's talk about paganism, Babylon, witchcraft, and the occult. To get understanding exactly what is paganism. Paganism is like a cancer that makes its way into our lives to block our path to the truth, to destroy our relationship with God. In other words, it's idolatry, everything that stands in the way of our relationship with God. See, the children of Israel thought they could interact among the pagans and the influence of the nations we got without getting drawn in. So let's look at the origins. Let's look at the beginnings. Genesis 11, 7 says, Go to, let us go down there and confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Therefore is the place called Babel. In other words, the word Babel means confusion. They, they were babbling because God confounded their language. The Tower of Babel was a, 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 one of the first places of rebellion. It was the first world government. It was a unified effort for global oneness. Do we hear a lot of that going on right now, that we need oneness, global oneness? We were, they were trying to bring peace and unity with God in the picture. In other words, we don't need God. We can do it ourselves. They were trying to reach the heavens, not literally, but spiritually. And understand that this happened, the same thing is happening in our day. These are the ancient empires, Babylon, which was also known as the New Age movement. The Assyrian barbarians also brought in cannibalism and child sacrifice. The Egyptians, to Pharaoh to them was God, and they worshipped the sun, which was raw. Jerusalem, the children of Israel, began to compromise with the heathens, and they brought the Canaanites, which brought sexual perversion and ritual human sacrifice. Now Israel began to serve other gods like Baal and Ashtoreth, and that's why they were taken into captivity. Here's some of the dark arts in Babylon, spellcasting, astrology, goddess worship, shamanism, charms, uh, castration, divination, amulets, uh, magic, and worshiping sacred animals. These were just some of the practices that were going on in Babylon. Babylon religion believed in reincarnation and karma. They believe when we die, we come back in another life to be reborn. In other words, if you don't get it right here, you're going to be reborn in another life. They also believed in the idea of the force, the force be with you. It's a, it's a, it's a universalism view that all is one. God is in all and all is one. Paganism was the religion of Jezebel, goddess worship. This is what we call neo-paganism, new paganism. This is where we start to see where it's more in tune with the earth and with nature. It's a worship of Baal. How about sacrificing to Baal? They believe Baal was a male, male fertility god. Nature worshipers, they would sacrifice their children to Baal. Remember they said that they would throw them into the fire. They would join priests and the temple prostitutes and sexual orgies to the gods for fertility, for prosperity and they were th they thought that they were doing the right thing turning away from God judges 7 5 says and in those days there was no king in Israel but every man did that which was right in his own eyes that's a 10 wor 10 letter word for paganism in other words this is paganism doing what you want to do fit what you see fit in your own eyes itself Jeremiah 10 Two says, learn not the way of the heathen, learn not the way of the pagans. 
And that's what we, in America, we're kind of just going after every wind of doctrine. We're tossed to and fro. Let's look at the cycle of Israel. First, it started off with the time of peace and prosperity. Then it went to a time of rebellion and paganism. Then they were brought into slavery. Then they repented. They cried out to the Lord and repented. And God restored them. You see, the cycle just continues today. This is the church cycle as well. We're going through this cycle. And right now, we're in the time of rebellion.